When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends. I'm Jared Halverson. This is Unshaken. And you and I just hit a milestone. Uh, 50,000 subscribers, which honestly blows my mind. When I started this channel last uh, spring when COVID hit, I figured, well, I'll be able to keep in touch with my Institute students and have a few hundred views every week. Uh, and that just has grown ever since then. And it really is amazing to me. Uh, so if you're one of those 50,000, I'm so grateful to have you as part of this growing family of unshaken saints. Uh, and if you're one who watches but hasn't yet clicked the subscribe button, just click it uh, and turn on notifications and, and uh, feel free to leave comments. And uh, I try to answer those when I can. Now, if, if that's the good news, we have bad news. And namely, it's section 98 and 101 today and then 99 and 100 in between. Uh, th this is some rough material in the Doctrine and Covenants because the saints are going through some rough stuff. Uh, I mean, it's ironic that they're literally going through hell at, at the location that heaven is supposed to break forth. And as ironic as that sounds, in some ways it seems really fitting. Yeah, that there is opposition in all things, but the greater the thing, the greater the opposition. I remember as a missionary, my sister sending me a note in the MTC that said, opposition is the evidence that the truth is at work. And that has stayed with me ever since. This is trying to establish Zion in Missouri. And there is opposition everywhere. It's like Brigham Young said about building temples at any time. The bells of hell begin to ring. That it's this red alert downstairs uh, because of what's taking place here on earth. Uh, establishing these outposts of spiritual strength. Uh, these epicenters of holiness and righteousness spreading across the earth. And, and of course, they're going to pull out all the stops and do everything they can to oppose it. That's exactly what's happening in Independence, Missouri in the 1830s. In fact, if you had to, or if I had to summarize today's lesson in a single phrase and try to fill it with as much alliteration as possible so it kind of sticks in the brain, I would say that the path to paradise is paved with problems and with pain, but also with promises. And as we study section 98 through 101 today, we'll see those problems and we'll sense that pain. I hope we'll also get a sense of the promises of God that will carry them through this path to paradise. And, and I use paradise uh, advisedly uh, because I mean, if you think about what the new, the new Jerusalem is supposed to be built there in Independence, that is the center spot of Zion. And to think of that where it all, it all comes full circle in this amazing way, because if that's kind of where it ends, it's also where it began. If that's going to be an epicenter of sorts for the second coming, it also happened to be the beginning of things. The Garden of Eden was there in Missouri also. And that to me says something as well, because what do we know about the Garden of Eden? Yes, it was paradise, but it was also home to a very subtle serpent. And to see the opposition that the saints are up against in their, in their Garden of Eden. It's going to be a place, just like Eden was, of difficult choices, of agency to exercise and consequences to live with. It's going to include wrestling with both good and evil, that fruit. But it will all occur within reach of the love of God, that other fruit. Fitting parallels indeed. Now, to understand a little bit of what's going on in this time period, we did set a bit of the historical stage last week in section 94 to 97. Uh, this idea of, of so much opposition and persecution in Missouri, but the one solution to their problem, counterintuitive as it might have been, was to build a temple. That, yes, the bells of hell are ringing, but they're ringing because you're so close. You just, you've got the cornerstones laid. You need to do something. Build this house of God. But that gut-wrenching irony we talked about last week, that 
there's no way we can do that. We are caught between a rock and a hard place. The rock of Revelation requiring that Zion be right here in western Missouri, and then the hard place, or namely the hard hearts of the neighbors that surround us. There was such a culture clash between the Latter-day Saints and their Missouri neighbors. Part of it was regional. I mean, if you think of Missouri as a slave state and, and a rabid racist one at that, when you talk about bleeding Kansas, well, it's because it's Missouri bleeding over into Kansas. Uh, this popular sovereignty of whoever can, can fill the territories uh, fastest, whether with abolitionists from the north or with, with slave owners from the south, that's going to determine the fate of, of the territories. And so you have all these Missouri, I mean, think about Western Missouri. Yeah, that's where Jackson County is. That's where Independence is. It's the edge of the frontier across the river, and it is Native American territory. Uh, and to see what a, a bunch of Yankees from New England and from Northeast Ohio streaming into this southern slave state. You want to talk about friction. It's happening there. In fact, one interesting detail, it, to, to me there's an irony that in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, the church was was looked down upon or persecuted because it was, it was deemed racist because of the policy on priesthood, which we'll talk about at length at the end of, the, of, the, of our year. Uh, but what's fascinating in the 1830s and 40s, it was the exact opposite, that much of the persecution in Missouri came because we, we weren't racist enough uh, for, the, for the tastes of those that, that they were settling among. In fact, W.W. Phelps, you remember he was in charge of the literary concerns, and so he was there living in Independence, publishing the church's newspaper, the Evening and Morning Star, uh, getting read, trying to get everything set to be able to publish the Book of Commandments. Well, he writes an article in the newspaper to free people of color because Missouri as a slave state had some really strict laws about even allowing free blacks to come into the state. They were, they were concerned about some racial unrest if, if enslaved African Americans came to know about free African Americans and started thinking, wait a minute, there, there's a better life out there that's possible? And so Missouri had some very strict laws on the books regarding free people of color, hence the name of this, of this newspaper article that Phelps wrote. And it was to, to kind of give the heads up. It's like, we want all to be able to gather to Zion. Uh, there was a firm belief in the Book of Mormon statement that all are alike unto God, both black and white, male and female, uh, bond and free. And, and so to invite all those to come and gather with the saints, but to be aware of some of the circumstances that they would find on the ground there in Zion. Well, the Missourians were up in arms over that, literally, uh, and came to, to accost W.W. Uh, w. Phelps over this, this inflammatory newspaper article. And he's like, whoa, that's, that's not what we were intending. But they didn't care. They, in fact, demanded, you've got 15 minutes to agree to evacuate the county. And again, between the rock and the hard place, it's like, I can't make that decision. I have no authority to do so. And on the other hand, I don't think God would allow me to because he put his pin in the map right here. Well, unable to make that agreement within 15 minutes, the, the mob basically had a different idea. Then fine, let's help the process. Let's speed things up. And so they throw the printing press out of the second story window they dismantle the printing shop. They tar and feather Bishop Partridge and Charles, Charles Allen. They're scattering the pages of the Book of Commandments. That's where those two wonderful young women come in and, and save as many pages as they can at the risk of their own lives. I mean, it's, it is intense until a few days into this, the leadership of the church in Missouri finally agrees with the mob to, to leave. Give us time, please to gather our belongings, to, to sell our property, to, to find a new place to live. And the mob graciously, I wish I could say, agreed to that, saying, fine, by next spring you're out of here, but you promise you'll leave. Now there's an, another amazing historical irony, because the exact same day that the leaders of the church in Missouri are signing this agreement, saying we'll, uh, we'll, abandon, uh, we'll, we'll abandon paradise, we'll leave our Garden of Eden to the snakes, uh, we, we will not settle here. The same day that the leaders of the Church of Missouri signed that petition, or, or that agreement, something else is going on in Kirtland. Namely, the leaders of the Church there, along with the saints, are laying the cornerstones of the Kirtland Temple. 
Remember what was the one saving grace or what would have been the saving grace in independence? Build a temple. What's taking so long in both church headquarters? And again, that interesting irony of abandoning their hopes in one area, just as they are laying the foundation stones in the other. Which will we be? Well, the revelations we're going to study today are going to give us some insight into how they should navigate it. And honestly, I hope we see the relevance to ourselves, especially if you ever find yourself in similar circumstances, on a path to paradise that happens to be paved with problems or with pain. For any of you who who have righteous desires and feel like there are obstacles before them at all times, those who, who just want to raise children and are struggling with infertility, or those who, who just want to serve a mission but physical or mental health challenges are standing in your way, those of you who are feeling opposition block your, your path to paradise, welcome to the club. Meet Moses and Adam and Eve and Joseph Smith and Edward Partridge and W.W. Phelps and these early saints that were going through it and needed the voice of God to reassure them that all would be well, that there was a purpose behind these problems and this pain. In fact, when section 98 was first recorded by the prophet, it, it was three days ahead of Oliver Cowdery's arrival in Kirtland. Oliver had been down in Independence, uh, seen all that was going on, and began the 900-mile journey, about two and a half weeks, to be able to come back to Kirtland to explain it all to Joseph Smith. Well, like I said, three days before he got there, Joseph is receiving this revelation. He doesn't yet know de- the details on the ground from fellow people on the ground, but he does get it from above. And it's amazing the kinds of details that the Lord gives in section 98 here, even before Joseph's fully aware of what's going on. Beautiful evidence of divine inspiration. The two focal points of section 98 will be about the law of the land. Since the Missourians were breaking it, they had no business enforcing uh, free American citizens off of their land and out of their county. It totally goes against the First Amendment of the Constitution about the free exercise of religion. Uh, and then there's other, an, another element of Section 98 is what we could call just war theory. What makes war justifiable? Uh, because the, uh, the second half of this revelation is going to focus on what do you do when you're attacked? How many cheeks do I have to turn before I can defend myself? So there's some very helpful counsel in section 98 regarding what the saints are going through, but also just it breathes this air of of reassurance, the promises of God, the the fruit of the tree of life is always within reach, even there when when the Garden of Eden seems to have been, been overrun with subtle serpents. Notice how the revelation begins. Verse 1, Verily I say unto you, my friends. So many of the recent revelations have begun with that that confirmation of relationship. Fear not, despite all that you're facing. Let your hearts be comforted, despite all of the, the challenges that you're enduring. Yea, rejoice evermore, despite news on the ground. And in everything, give thanks. Yes, even the hard things that you're enduring right now. Joseph is at least aware of some of the challenges, and and the Lord is completely aware of them. We'll see that spelled out in the next few verses. But to see despite what they're facing, it's like I tell my kids whenever we go through hard things, attitude is everything. When, when, I, when we left Tennessee, uh, the, my students there gave me this beautiful gift. It's, it's still in, uh, displayed prominently in my home here in Utah, and it was this kind of poster framed that says, Halversons do hard things. Uh, and they were aware of some of the things that we'd gone through when we were in our time in Tennessee. And, and that was kind of one of our family mottos. And, and to see, that, again, attitude is everything. That Halversons do hard things, or that in this case, the saints do. And they come away with, from those things fearlessly. I mean, can we, again, this is a tall order in verse 1. But can we allow those attitudes to come? And actually, I use the word allow for a reason, too. And again, if you see verse 1, fear not. You're trying to establish Zion. You're trying to 
lay the foundation of the new Jerusalem, and it will be a matter of faith. It cannot be a matter of fear. If you think about the 12 spies in Israel that, that crossed the Jordan River to scope out the promised land, and they come back amazed at the size of the grapes, for example. Uh, but the, but the, ten of the 10 of those spies think, well, yeah, the grapes are big, but the people are even bigger, and they're going to eat us alive. There's no way we'll be able to conquer the promised land. And then the other two spies, Joshua and Caleb, they don't take counsel from their fears. They take counsel from their faith. And they try to reassure Israel, we can do this with God. Yeah, the people are big, but God is bigger than they are. Than they are. Well, unfortunately, Israel listened to the fear of the ten more than the faith of the two. And so what did God say? Fine, I can afford to wait, even if, if you can't. I'll wait for the next generation, and we'll see where they are on the balance between fear and faith. And yeah, the two faithful, Joshua and Caleb, they'll outlive the rest of you to, to be part of that second opportunity. We have to go forward without fear. That's what was keeping them from building the temple in Missouri. Uh, the, the faith to build, ah, or the fear staring me in the face that they've got a musket loaded, they've got their pitchfork aimed, uh, they've already destroyed the printing press, we've, we've seen someone tarred and feathered. We, we can't stay. And so they agree to leave. Don't take counsel from your fears. And then that other part, let your hearts be comforted. That's that idea of allowing this attitude to change. Because if God is sending his spirit, a.k.a. his comforter, will we allow that comforter to do his work? Remember that line from, from the book of, uh, of Moses when Enoch sees just the horrible wickedness of the world and he's so devastated by it that he, that's the way he says it. He said he was in bitterness of soul and he refused to be comforted. I don't know what it is that makes it sometimes of, of do we prefer the pity party or do we, I mean, honestly have reason to fear and, and be anxious? Why do we stiff arm God? Why do we close ourselves off? from the comfort that can come through the Holy Ghost. Just submit, just yield. Please let your heart be comforted. And if you'll just put your dukes down and just soften your heart and open it, and all of a sudden you realize, I, I shouldn't be feeling this comforted, but I do. I shouldn't be feeling this fearless because I know the odds I'm up against. But, but I do. I shouldn't, I have no business rejoicing based on the, the circumstances I find myself in. But I just find myself smiling despite the pain to the point that I can give thanks in everything. Even in the things I'm going through right now. Even in the hard trials, the gut-wrenching circumstances that you deal with. In everything, give thanks. In verse 2, he continues this, this beautiful recommend, the, the, the counsel that he gives, waiting patiently on the Lord. Oh, sometimes it's, no, I, I, I'll feel uh, fearlessness and comfort and joy and thanksgiving once I'm out of the problem. And he's like, no, if, you're, if you know you're going to feel that eventually, you might as well start feeling it now. My wife and I say that sometimes where it's like we're in the middle of, of the, something difficult. Halverson's doing hard things. Uh, and we'll say, you know what? Someday we're going to laugh about this. Eh, so we might as well jump the gun and start laughing now. Yeah, it beats tears at least. In the meantime, can we wait patiently on the Lord? For your prayers have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. They're recorded with this seal and testament. The Lord hath sworn and decreed that they shall be granted. That's some powerful promise language. We'll see continued in the next verse. But notice what he says as far as, how can I wait patiently? Usually what allows us to be patient in our waiting is knowing that the waiting will eventually pay off. That there's a sense of anticipation that we know we won't have to wait forever. And that assurance comes in verse 2 with the confirmation that God has heard your prayers. Your prayers have entered into his ears. He's aware of this. So what are you acknowledging there? It's God's omniscience. I know you're hearing this. I know that you're aware of us. 
It's just a matter of when will you come to our rescue. Waiting patiently, I guess I can wait, patiently or otherwise, <laughs> because I know you know what we're going through. If, and if that is, a, is, a, is faith in his omniscience, the fact he's referred to as the Lord of Sabaoth is evidence of faith in his omnipotence. Remember, he, we've seen that, that title several times in recent uh, sections. He, they never used that title earlier on, but it's interesting that here, when there seems to be a war in the works, the Lord keeps introducing himself in that way. The Lord of Sabaoth is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. And if he has an, it's like Jesus in Gethsemane, Peter, put your sword away. God could call and send 12 legions of angels to rescue me. He is the, the, the God of armies. Uh, and, there, and more there be that with us than those that be with them. To, to trust in that, th those armies of angels that the Lord is willing to send in our behalf. I trust God's omniscience. I, I trust he's aware and that he has an army behind him ready to come to the rescue. And he's promised that. Notice that language at the end of two and into three. Words like uh, recorded. It's like signed, sealed, delivered. It's been recorded, stamped, and notarized, and, and in triplicate. It has a seal. It has a testament. The Lord has sworn. He's decreed that these promises will come. In verse three, he, therefore he giveth this promise unto you with an immutable covenant that they shall be fulfilled. It doesn't get any stronger than that. An immutable, that means unchangeable covenant. I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say. Bound to do what I promised you, and I promised you deliverance if you'll simply exercise faith in me. Remember all the ifs of section 97 last week? Five different ifs, and they were all boiled down to if you'll obey, if you'll do what I ask, if you'll exercise faith in me. Zion won't be moved. Zion will be preserved. Zion will prosper right there in paradise and in Jackson County, Independence, Missouri. Well, these promises, immutable, despite the odds, keep going in verse 3, and all things wherewith you have been afflicted shall work together for your good. And to my name's glory, saith the Lord. Such powerful words of, of confirmation, of, of reassurance. Th those words, by the way, are an echo of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. Uh, to this day, it's one of my favorite verses of all scripture. That all things work together for good to them that love God. And notice that, uh, that emphasis on all things and working together. He didn't say, and every specific event in your life in isolation will be awesome. Everything is awesome. It's a, great, it's a catchy tune, but it, that's not, no, there's a lot of things that aren't awesome. And what the saints were going through in both Missouri and in Ohio weren't awesome. But back up a bit and look at the entire canvas instead of fixating on that one dark line that you, that's right in front of you. And you'll see that that's a shadow that's there for a reason because it brings out the light that is shining elsewhere in the painting. Or to think of, I mean, you want to switch the metaphor, uh, to think of ingredients that by themselves are bitter or sour. But once they, they mix with everything else in the recipe, something turns out delicious on the other side. I mean, what is salt doing in cookies, for example? Uh, I mean, it's, the, uh, it's, cookies are something sweet. Just put in the sugar. Well, no, the salt does something. And it works together with all the other ingredients in ways that seen in isolation would be more negative. In fact, speaking of salt, I remember as a kid in like physical science class, learning that salt was made up of sodium and chlorine. And I remember the, the teacher saying, did you realize that, that uh, sodium reacts violently to water and yet the oceans are full of salt, which contains sodium? And I'm like, what? And then they said, oh, and chlorine is a poisonous gas. And yet we consume amazing quantities of, of chlorine all the time in our table salt. And I just, as a little kid thinking, no. Way. How's this is kind of mind blown? Like something that will blow up in water and something that'll kill you 
fills the seas and, and fills our bodies. And how is that possible? Because things in isolation that could be dangerous or devastating, there's the problems and pain. When you bring them together, you notice that all things work together for good. Now, that's with the caveat that Paul brings up, as long as you love God. Because as you love God and open your heart to God, He's the one that helps you overcome fear and, and become comforted and to rejoice and to give thanks and to have the eternal perspective where you see the entire canvas or understand how these, these different elements are coming together for your good and for His glory, to trust in that. If you're in one of those shadow stages, wait for the light. If you're feeling the, the bitterness of a particular in ingredient, just wait until the recipe is done. I promise it'll be, a, it'll be a masterpiece. Actually, God promises it, and His covenant is immutable. Now, with all of that as background, you have to read the rest of section 98 through the, the lens of verses 1, 2, and 3. Uh, be thankful for what you're going through. I know you're up against it, but rejoice in these things. And now let's get into your specifics. Uh, the, the illegality of what the Missourians are doing to you. Let's talk about the law of the land for a moment. Verse 4, Now verily I say unto you concerning the laws of the land. It is my will that my people should observe to do all things whatsoever I command them. Now, it's funny there, it's like, wait, wait, I thought you were going to talk about the laws of the land. Like, oh, I will, really starting in verse 5. Yeah, but even as I, as I first hint that, that that's, that's where I'm going, I want to reiterate that my laws are even more important than, than worldly laws. We're going to talk about the law and the need to render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But even before we get there, please prioritize keeping the commandments of God. Uh, Put first the kingdom of God, and the rest of the things will fall into place. Build the temple there, counterintuitive as it might be. Things will work out. Obe obedience, spiritual obedience, needs to be our first and foremost priority. But since I told you I'd be talking about the laws of the land, and that's really what you were wondering about, we'll get there. Verse 5. And that law of the land, which is constitutional, supporting that principle of freedom and maintaining rights and privileges, belongs to all mankind and is justifiable before me. So even though it's, it's down a notch or two or 20 uh, from the law of God, the law of man is important too. Uh, you live in civil society. There's a social contract, okay? And, and so there's a need to have laws to help govern things. And that's justifiable, and that's actually good. But notice the caveat in verse 5, where he says, The law of the land, which is constitutional. And the fact that we need a judicial branch, the Supreme Court, to interpret the law, to, to see if it's constitutional or not, that suggests that there may be some lower laws uh, from lesser courts or legislators that, that are not constitutional. And there's going to be some friction and conflict uh, between the federal government and the First Amendment, which applies to the federal government, and, and states like Missouri that think about states' rights and popular sovereignty and think, well, yeah, the, the U.S. Congress can't say anything against religious freedom, but they didn't say anything about the, the legislature of, of the state of Missouri. Uh, what, what can we get away with? And so the, the Lord is being careful here. That, yeah, human law, civil law is good, but it better be constitutional. And by constitutional, what does he mean? I, I love the definition in verse 5. It's constitutional if it supports principles of freedom, if it maintains rights and privileges. And then this one's important, especially for a slave state like Missouri. And it better belong to all mankind. That's the part that's justifiable before me. You cannot, there, there wasn't meant to be an asterisk in the Declaration of Independence when it said that all men are created equal. It wasn't supposed to be asterisk, see footnote, and then it's like, yes, men as in only males. And, and make sure that they're white males. And make sure they're property holding white males. And it's like, what, seriously? So, so uh, women have no say in things, and those that aren't white males don't have, I mean, so race is an issue, gender is an issue, uh, status, social status, or wealth. No, that's not constitutional. 
Freedoms should apply across the board to all mankind. And so there's, there shouldn't be any racial issues on this. There shouldn't be any religious issues on this. Just because the Latter-day Saints are a beleaguered religious minority, that does not give the majority a justification to attack them or to expel them. You see, the, the irony of, of freedom of the majority in the United States, in fact, when de Tocqueville came and toured the United States in this exact time period, he kept talking about the tyranny of the majority. It's a phrase he used over and over in his great book, Democracy in America. And it's just, that, yeah, the majority, it's not just the king that can tyrannize. Uh, it's not just the tyranny of the monarchy. There can be a tyranny of the majority. And that's what's happening in Missouri. And so, no, minority rights need to be preserved. And the Constitution should guarantee that. It should maintain their rights, their privileges across the board all mankind. See, verse 6, Therefore I, the Lord, justify you and your brethren of my church in befriending that law, here's the caveat again, which is the constitutional law of the land. We don't, I mean, there's a separation of church and state. Uh, Thomas Jefferson talked about a wall of separation. Uh, that's not in the Constitution. Um, but this idea of separating church and state was really meant to protect the church from the state. Uh, unfortunately, in our day, uh, secular society has flipped that as if it were intended to be, we got to protect the state from the church. Uh, and, and that was never the intent. In this case, to see that there doesn't have to be a complete separation in terms of uh, people of faith should live the law of the land. I mean, this is the 12th article of faith, right? We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates, and honoring, obeying, sustaining the law, the law of the land. Yes, we should be good disciples, but we should also be good citizens. And in verse 4 is be good disciples, keep my law. Verse 5 and 6 is, well, be good citizens too, and keep the law of the land. But that law should be constitutional. That's the law that is worth befriending. Then in verse 7, as pertaining to law of man, whatsoever is more or less than this cometh of evil. If there's some kind of law that goes beyond the Constitution, is that government overreach? And if there are laws that go beneath the Constitution and don't maintain rights and privileges, if they don't honor the freedom and protect and preserve the freedom of all mankind, then, it, then that cometh of evil. In fact, it cometh of the evil one. Isn't that just war in heaven uh, reheated <laughs> and reserved? The war in heaven? No, it's not about agency. Uh, well, we don't want them to have it. We don't want rights and privileges. We don't want principles of freedom. Uh, it, but Satan's plan it went was uh, more or less than the constitutional law of God that preserved and protected our moral agency. Now, verse 8, returning to this theme of freedom, I, the Lord God, make you free. And what's the phrase from the Declaration? That they are endowed with, by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. There you have it. I, the Lord God, make you free. Therefore, ye are free indeed. It's, the Constitution isn't giving you something that you don't already have. It's simply recognizing what you've been granted by God himself. And the law, he continues, also maketh you free. So the, the constitutional law of the land, like I said, is just recognizing what should be obvious to us all, that God has made us free. Governments or governors or legislatures or mobs shouldn't reduce you from the level God placed you on earth. Uh, if, if God makes you free, the law should, should continue to make you free. Nevertheless, verse 9, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. I mean, I'll take a King Benjamin any day, but man, if it also opens up the opportunity for a King Noah, then maybe we don't, we don't want to go that path. With the wicked rule, the people mourn. And that can be true of wicked presidents, uh, all the way down to a wicked populace that puts those people in place. No wonder verse 10 counsels this. Wherefore, honest men and wise men should be sought for diligently. And good men and wise men, ye should observe to uphold. 
Otherwise, whatsoever is less than these cometh of evil. Now take a second and look at verse 10 at the verbs and the adjectives. The verbs, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be seeking diligently for these types of rulers, of leaders, of civil servants. And we're supposed to uphold them once we've found them. I honestly wonder sometimes, I've felt frustrated repeatedly when uh, there's a general election and it's been reduced down to two possibilities and honestly I don't like either one. Uh, and there's a part of me that thinks, how do we get ourselves into this problem? And I wonder, is it, is it too late by then? Because early on in the process we haven't sought for diligently the kind of people I would want to vote for. And what ends up happening when it's just somebody that finally makes it through the, the I don't know, the, the grinding of the political gears and, and the party ma machinery, and this is the one that has the backing of the party, and it's all party, party, party. There's a, there's a piece of me that wishes we would have listened to George Washington in his, in his uh, final address when he just says, please don't fall into party politics. Uh, we're seeing the, the lack of bipartisanship, the inability to, to reach across the aisle. Uh, it, it's hard. And, and so are, are we seeking diligently the best kinds of people to serve? Or has politics become such a, well, such a game of politics that the kind of people verse 10 describes don't want to have anything to do with it? And so we're left with choosing between the lesser of two evils? Or as I've heard some of you once say, the evil of two lessers. Th that's the only options we have. I honestly wonder sometimes in an election, how many people actually vote for a candidate they really like, as opposed to simply voting against a candidate they're really scared of. And I'll, I'll just take whatever we have left over. It, it's, it wouldn't be as bad as the other outcome. That, that's a scary uh, society in which to live. Uh, so we need to seek them diligently and we need to uphold them once they're found. And who's they that we're looking for? What are the adjectives here? There's three and I love them. Honest, wise, and good. Can you imagine uh, presidents and vice presidents and congress uh, persons and you know, legislature, legislators and judges and mayors and city council men and women being honest, wise, and good. I don't even care what party they're a part of. The Lord doesn't even dig down into, into platform, let alone party. Uh, he just wants us to find honest and wise and good people. Because if they're honest, I can believe them, even if I don't always agree with them. And there goes my skepticism. If they're wise, then I can support them, I can uphold them, or I can at least work with them, even if I don't see eye to eye on every issue. There's a wisdom there. It's, they're they're going to weigh the options. They're going to try to find the best possible solution. And so now there's no obstructionism there. I'm not going to just get in their way because I think they're idiots. And third, if they're, if they're good, if there's at least a, a virtue, a morality, then I can trust them. And now there's no cynicism. And if you think about what, what's grinding the wheels of, of government to a, to a standstill in our day, is I think there's, there's too much skepticism and obstructionism and cynicism. And those three isms come because we don't, don't believe people. We don't believe that they're honest. We don't, we don't believe that they're wise or we don't trust that they're good. And, and no wonder we find ourselves in, in the state that we find ourselves in today. I am grateful for, for honest, wise, and good people in both parties that may have different means, but often share the same end in mind of what we're trying to do to preserve rights and privileges and support principles of freedom for all mankind. Now, in verse 11, I give unto you a commandment, because so much of what I just described is best case scenario, and you're not living best case scenario. You're part of the, the mourning people because the wicked are ruling. So what can you do in the meantime? 
I give unto you a commandment that ye shall forsake all evil and cleave unto all good, that ye shall live by every word which proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God. Including all those words that proceeded last week about build the temple. And more importantly, build yourself into a temple worthy and temple ready people. Be pure in heart. That's Zion. People, not just Zion place. Be pure in heart so that you can see God. And just as importantly, so that others can see God in you. Be the kind of people. In fact, when he says forsake all evil, it's like give your neighbors no reason to hate you and cleave unto all good. Give them reason to respect you, even if they don't have reason to believe as you do. There's something about this, this neighborliness that if you'll avoid the sins of commission, there's forsake all evil, reject the sins of omission, that's cleave unto all good, remove the impediments and obstacles, the encumbrances, we saw that word a few weeks ago, uh, that would keep your neighbors from accepting you and, and hoping that more of you come because of how good and how kind and how wise and how honest you are. You've got to be better neighbors to them. Uh, and then they'll end up being better neighbors to you. And how do you do that? You do it by living by every word which proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God. All that I've taught you. Just live as I'm trying to, to help you to become. Verse 12, for he will give up unto the faithful, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's what he's doing right here. I'm adding to these words of life that are coming. And then this interesting phrase at the end of 12, and I will try you and prove you herewith. You see what the Lord's really after? It's, we talked about this before. It's not stake centers I'm, I'm trying to build. It's, spirit, it's spiritual strength. It's, it's the Zion people and not the Zion place. Ye are the temple of God, and I'm trying you. I'm proving you. You are being passed through the furnace of affliction because I want you to shine on the other side of it. So pass your test. Now, just how hard might this test be? Look at verse 13. Whoso layeth down his life in my cause for my name's sake shall find it again, even life eternal. Like, oh, that's great. Wait, wait, are, are you, do you mean that? Seriously? We're talking possibilities of martyrdom? Whew. Uh, so the, the tarring and feathering of, of Bishop Partridge and Charles Allen wasn't bad enough. Uh, tearing apart a, a printing establishment, that, that, it could get worse. Yeah, it could get worse. There have been oh, foreshadowings and foreboding regarding those dark possibilities from the beginning of the Doctrine and Covenants. There's a section 5 and section 6 where the Lord starts dropping hints to Joseph Smith with things like, hey, even, I mean, don't worry about persecution. They can't do anything worse to you than what they did to me. And Joseph's probably like, is that supposed to make me feel better? They killed you. And the Lord would be like, yeah, but... I'm resurrected. I mean, it's, it's fine. It's not, death isn't permanent. Uh, well, easy for you to say. Well, maybe, maybe not. Here, what's the Lord promising? Eternal life. A martyr's crown. Even if it comes to that. And for some Latter-day Saints, it would. I mean, if you can digest, if you can metabolize that worst-case scenario then anything shy of that, hey, it's not as bad as it, it could have been. And I was prepared for the worst. I was prepared to lay down my life, just leaving my possessions, just suffering some persecution. That's, that's nothing. In verse 14, therefore, be not afraid of your enemies. What, what could they possibly threaten you with that's more scary than death? And when death no longer holds any terror, then they've got nothing. They have no leverage. Be not afraid of your enemies, for I have decreed in my heart, there's a heartfelt promise coming, saith the Lord, that I will prove you in all things, whether you will abide in my covenant, even unto death, that you may be found worthy. Oh, okay, this really is a test. And, and the grade really matters. Will you abide in my covenant? And not just when it's easy, but when it's hard, will you keep commandment against the odds? 
Remember last week we talked about it's not enough to observe your covenants. It's can you observe your covenants by sacrifice? Can you, I mean, this is the story of Job, right? Okay, yeah, trust God when he's given you all the good stuff, but will you still trust him when it's all taken away? Will you abide in the covenant when you have to risk it all? Because if the guarantee is, I mean, again, it's immutable promises. They're all, really, the blessings really are guaranteed, but you have to wait patiently for them. You have to see them with the eye of faith and then hold out faithful until they come. And sometimes they don't come to the other side. So in the meantime, it'd be so easy. It wouldn't even be sacrifice. It'd just be investment with a guaranteed return on it. But to have this kind of gut check, oh, now it's a test. Now I really am being proven. Now God's learning something about me. Well, he already knew it, but I'm learning something about me. I really am faithful, no matter what. Because in verse 15, if you will not abide in my covenant, you're not worthy of me. I mean, ouch, but yeah, harsh, but true. Not worthy of him. Because what did he do for me? <laughs> Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. What did he call them at the beginning of this revelation? My friends. As he's talking about if you lay down your life, you'll find it again, life eternal. I did. Again, I'm not asking you to do anything I didn't do myself. They can't do anything worse to you than what they did to me. I thought and I knew, I still know, that you were worthy of that. That... The worth of souls is great in the sight of God. And I put my money where my mouth was. I laid down my life for you. Will you be willing to, to reciprocate? Verse 16, therefore. So we've painted the worst case scenario. But what else should you be doing? Therefore, renounce war and proclaim peace. And seek diligently to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers and the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now that last phrase should ring some bells, right? There's Malachi 4, there's Doctrine and Covenants 2, there's the angel Moroni appearing to Joseph Smith. There's temple work, right? And they're trying to, you're supposed to build a temple. You really want things to, to work out, hearts have to turn. But in the context here of your enemies and facing persecution and wicked ruling and, and people mourning, how do you, how do you overcome evil? You do it with light. How do you, if war grows out of hatred, then how do we avoid war? We avoid hatred. And how do we do that? We plant love. We turn hearts to one another. I, mean, I love the way verse 16 begins. Renounce war. Just proclaim peace. Say that our preference every time is peace. We're not Quakers. There's not that level of pacifism. Uh, there is, war can be a necessary evil. Uh, Captain Moroni is the poster boy for it, who never delighted in the shedding of blood, even when he was required by circumstance to shed some. It's amazing what Captain Moroni and his army was able to do. They renounced war, even when they sometimes had to engage in it. They proclaimed peace at every opportunity. And even as their the whole sharpening their swords, they're also going forth with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And they are preaching to their enemy. They're trying to turn hearts. I think it was Anne Madsen, after living in Jerusalem for a time, that said, there will be no peace in the Middle East until mothers teach their children to love instead of hate. If hearts of fathers to children, children to fathers, and realize we're all we all have a common father in God, making us all brothers and sisters. And why on earth would I fight you when, when we're related? Now, now, if that makes sense in 16, 17 is a little trickier. 17, again, the hearts of the Jews unto the prophets and the prophets unto the Jews. Lest I come and smite the whole earth with a curse and all flesh be consumed before me. That's smiting the earth with a curse. That's Malachi 4 also. But... That, that idea of the hearts of the Jews under the prophets, what's that all about? Is there some big oh, synagogue in independence and, and a little branch of the, of the house of Israel? And No. What does Judaism have to do with what the saints are dealing with? Well, 
I, I wonder, I don't, I don't know for sure, I just was trying to wrap my head around this phrase, why would he say this? And I thought, were well, the Jews unto the prophets? I mean, the, the, Judaism's all about their prophets, right? The Torah. Uh, and to see, are we following what the prophets have taught? Now, that goes far beyond Jews, because Christians have prophets and Muslims have prophets and, and atheists still have sages and philosophers. And I'll just put it this way, we all have counsel from our, uh, from our best or better selves. Uh, it's what Abraham Lincoln talked about, uh, living into the better angels of our nature. Uh, as a Latter-day Saint, do I heed the words of my prophets? Uh, as a Jew, do they, uh, have their hearts been turned to the prophets? And to me, there's just something about appealing to someone's best beliefs. And I think what, what causes friction is any of us, or all of us, worst case scenario, falling beneath those things, not living up to the standards we hold ourselves to, not, not holding to the prophets that we accept. And whether that's a Jew not, you know, falling short of what Moses would say, or uh, a Buddhist falling short of the, the amazing counsel of the Buddha, uh, do Catholics live up to what the Pope is asking them to live? Do, do Protestants live up to the the great council of a Luther or a Calvin. I mean, you understand what I'm trying to say here? I, I hope this makes sense. I, I hope it makes it applicable. That if we can work within, I, I remember hearing this uh, when we were, when because of uh, Islamic extremism in terms of terrorism, and my heart went out to all of my Muslim friends at the time, thinking, oh no, they're getting branded uh, and painted with the same broad brush. It's like every Latter-day Saint being lumped together with the fundamentalists, for example. And it's like, no, 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 that's not us. Uh, well, that, I sense that from all my Muslim friends. And I thought, how do you diffuse Islamic extremism? I can't go in at, with guns blazing and say that it, Islam is false, because it isn't. There is so much truth in the Quran. There's so much goodness and wisdom and honesty uh, in the teachings of Muhammad. Uh, and sadly, some people take them to the extreme or, or kind of hijack the, the words of their prophets when that's not what the prophet intended. And, and to me, there's something about instead of attacking from without, instead working from within. And imagine a, a, an Islamic extremist learning of the real peace that lies at the heart of Islam. If Islam means surrender, and surrendering to those better angels of our nature, how oh, there'd be much more hope to proclaim peace and renounce war. And, and I'm not trying to sig sig single out Islamic extremism, because there's Christian fundamentalism, and there's, I mean, there's, there's problems all over the place. And so to just be true to your best beliefs, whatever those beliefs might be, because there's going to be some best ones in there. Uh, and as you live into them, hearts will turn and, and peace will prevail. Now, verse 18, again, back to the worst case scenario, because that might take a while, and not when we're suffering in the meantime, let not your hearts be troubled. Again, that idea of yielding, submitting, I'm trying to comfort you, please let it happen. Don't refuse to be comforted. Let your hearts let not your hearts be troubled. For in my Father's house are many mansions, and I have prepared a place for you. And where my Father and I am, there ye shall be also. Again, that reassurance, even in the face of death itself. There's a mansion on the other side of martyrdom. Then in verse 19, the Lord seems to shift his gaze. And it's not just, well, all those wicked Missourians and all those horrible people out there that are persecuting you. In verse 19, he says, Behold, I, the Lord, am not well pleased with many who are in the church at Kirtland. Ouch. I, I would have expected him to say something like, I, the Lord, am not well pleased with many, many of the mobbers in, in independence. But it's not the mobbers he's worried about. It's the members of the church. And it's not even Missouri he's focused on in that verse. It's Ohio. It's Kirtland. And I scratch my head and wonder, why, why is he shifting his attention? And then I realize, oh, yeah. If Kirtland is uh, 
the, the staging ground, so to speak, if this is the proving place to prepare people to then go down to, to Missouri, if Kirtland is where you're supposed to become a Zion people, so that then you can go down and inherit a Zion place, yeah, no wonder the problem started a little earlier. And as people were jumping the gun and, and outpacing, the, getting there, getting to the place before they became the people, no wonder there's problems and no wonder there's friction. No wonder there's no temple because they hadn't become the temple of God in advance of that. So you in Kirtland, you've got some repenting to do. That's what he says in 20. They do not forsake their sins and their wicked ways. That's lack of repentance. The pride of their hearts, their covetousness, all their detestable things, and observe the words of wisdom and eternal life which I have given unto them. I mean, earlier when he said, you've got to live by every word that proceedeth forth out of my mouth, you're not doing that. You're not observing the words of wisdom, eternal life that I'm holding out to you. Instead, holding to your wicked ways, instead of just succumbing to them and then repenting as quickly as, quickly as you can, and then this, the pride of your hearts and covetousness, again, by definition, that's not Zion. Because if Zion is of one heart, no, now they got pride of their heart. If the, Zion is, there's no poor among you, but here there's covetousness. If Zion is all dwelling in righteousness, and yet they are guilty of detestable things, that's a strong word. What kinds of things are they doing that the Lord would abhor to the point of saying that is detestable? Well, that, they're, they're just certainly not Zion. So no wonder Zion isn't being established in Missouri. It all the problems are starting in Kirtland. We've got to purify ourselves, cleanse the inner vessel, get prepared to then go and build Zion where the Lord commands us. Now verse 21, Verily I say unto you that I the Lord will chasten them and will do whatsoever I list if they do not repent and observe all things whatsoever I have said unto them. I mean, if this is to try you and to prove you and you're not doing very well on the test. I mean, this is a good coach because what's a coach? I mean, well, the thing about athletics is the testing and trying becomes obvious because we're keeping score and you can see if you're winning or losing. And when your team is being tested and proven and they're not, they're not correcting their mistakes, they're not functioning as a team, then no one, I, I had some good chew out sessions at halftime in the locker room. Uh, and coaches were, were, were not shy about chastening us. And if we'd listened to them, if we were coachable, then we'd always come roaring back in the second half and do better than we did in the first. That's the promise in verse 22. Again, I say unto you, if ye observe to do whatsoever I command you, if you'll just be coachable and follow the, follow the plays that I call, then I, the Lord, will turn away all wrath and indignation from you. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Notice he said, all wrath and indignation, not just mine. Yes, the Lord is frustrated here. Uh, you're not obeying the commandments. But more often than not, you're punished by your sins rather than for them. It's not my wrath and indignation you should be worried about. You're feeling plenty of it from, from closer quarters. You're feeling the wrath and indignation of your Missouri neighbors. And if you'll do another one of these ifs, we saw a bunch last week. Another if, if you'll obey, if you'll observe to do what I say, then the Missourians won't have anything to complain about you either. And their wrath and indignation will be turned away as well. That, that idea of turning away, by the way, great play on words. Because in the Greek, the idea of repenting is turning. And so will you repent of your sins and forsake your evil ways or not? Because if you turn away from your sins, then I will turn away all wrath and indignation. One of us is going to, it's like we'll both turn together or neither one of us will. Because if you hold to yours, then the wrath and indignation will, will stay with you as well. Verse 23, now I speak unto you concerning your families. Now, now we're, we see another pivot point. Because it's one thing, it's like, okay, I can take it. Uh, they, like Edward Partridge, he took that tarring and feathering with such meekness that ultimately the mob started feeling guilty. I mean, because he turned the other cheek so mercifully, they, they ended up turning away their wrath and indignation. Amazing how that worked. 
But it's one thing to suffer yourself. But to see your loved ones suffer, that's, that's a gut check and a, a gut punch unlike anything else. And so there's, I, I feel for the, the fathers in, in these households. Because it's not a bunch of solitary settlers in Missouri. It's families moving there to establish Zion. And so what do I do with my family, though? If it was just me, I could either take it or I could fight back. But what do I, I'm putting my wife and children in harm's way. What do I do? And so here's the counsel on just war theory. Uh, the idea behind just war theory is what justifies war. I read a book once in, in grad school. It was a moral history of the Civil War, which was fascinating. Because the historian that wrote it was taking all the events of the Civil War, year by year, it was a long book, and pa passing them through the lens of just war theory. Uh, are there, is it justified? Is it a defensive war or an, or an offensive war? Is it, how much de collateral damage is there to civilians and so on? So it was the kinds of things that Lincoln was doing was that justifiable? Was it moral? Uh, Sherman's march to the sea, was that justifiable? Did it, did it fit the criteria of just war theory? Well, here's the Lord's view on war. Here's spiritual just war theory. And it has to do with them thinking of their families first. Verse 23, now I speak unto you concerning your families. If men will smite you or your families once, and ye bear it patiently, and revile not against them, neither seek revenge, ye shall be rewarded. Now we're going to go one, two, three, four, several times in the rest of this revelation to see what, as, I mean, how many cheeks do I have to turn? Okay? And this first one, the, the first one you have to turn. If they smite you or your family, if it's one time, bear it patiently. Don't revile against them, so that's watch your words. And don't seek revenge. So there's watch your actions. And what will happen? You'll be rewarded. As opposed to verse 24, if ye bear it not patiently, it shall be accounted unto you as being meted out as a just measure unto you. I mean, he didn't even get to the don't revile and don't uh, seek revenge. He just stopped with it. If you can't even bear it patiently, then you deserved it. And it's like, wait, what? Deserved it? I didn't do anything. They started it. It's like, yeah, but consider it punishment in advance. Now, now I'm, I'm blown away by verse 24, honestly, this idea of punishment in advance. I mean, can you imagine me as a parent doing that? Like if, if two siblings are fighting and it's like, well, he started it. Because that's always how it, how it begins, right? That's always the, it's not my fault. They started it. Well, as a parent, so often it's like, well, you had the chance to finish it. Why didn't you? It's like, no, no, but they started it. It's like, well, it, but if you were going to respond in that way, then I guess you deserved it. They were punishing you in advance. Punish me for what? I hadn't done anything. Well, you were going to do something. What was I going to do? You were going to respond negatively. You were going to fight back, or you're going to get angry, or you, whatever it was. And so they just beat you to the punch. I'm going to attack you for your inability to, to handle my attack. Now again, we still scratch our heads and go, that seems really weird, unfair. But the irony there is whether or not God punishes us in advance, we do that to each other all the time. It's almost like he's just, oh, this is your level of things. Let me, let me, let me get there for a moment. Because the irony is, and we see this so often in interpersonal discord, conflict, that when I attack someone and they respond in kind, then I totally feel justified. It's like I was a jerk to them, but they were a jerk back to me. So I, they deserved me being a jerk. We're both jerks. And we almost lose sight of who started it. It's, it's, that's human nature. Uh, part of our, our self-deception oh, is, is wanting to justify our hatred of others by finding things within them that, that make us feel like they deserved it all along. I mean, think about it in your own case. I think we're guilty of that. I think, sadly, we've had personal experience. That's why turning the cheek the first time is such a, a shock to the system of the other person. Because they're like, wait a minute, I was a jerk to you. I was expecting you to be a jerk back so I would feel good about my jerkiness because we're both, we're both that way. I'm no better or worse. I'm no worse than you are. Well, all of a sudden, if you respond in kindness, 
that forces me to reckon with, they didn't deserve that. I started it and they did end it. How's that work? I, there was only one jerk and it was me. That's why I'm amazed at the anti-Nephi-Lehi's. They maintained the higher ground because that, that after they just faced martyrdom and had no fear, now they lived section 98 perfectly, and the enemy comes, and when they realize I was not justified in attacking them, I'm certainly not justified in continuing to attack them, uh, I have proof now that they're not like me. They're better. They're standing on higher moral ground, and I'm cut my own conscience here, and so I throw down my weapons and end up joining them. It's amazing how that works. And so the idea of being punished in advance is a fascinating principle. Now that's the first time. Verse 25, again, if your enemy shall smite you the second time, and you revile not against your enemy and bear it patiently, your reward shall be an hundredfold. So if you're just rewarded the first time, Whatever that reward might be, now multiply by 100 uh, the, the second time. And then 26, again, if, you sh if he shall smite you the third time, and ye bear it patiently, your reward shall be doubled unto you fourfold. Now, does that mean times it by eight? I'm not sure. You double it fourfold. Well, it was, it was blessing X, and now it's on the first time. Then it's blessing 100X the second time, and then it's blessing 800X. I, my math is starting to get a little fuzzy here, and I think the Lord actually intends that. It's like the 7 times 70. No, you're not supposed to count to 490. You're supposed to lose track, <laughs> okay? Lose track of the offenses. I'm certainly going to lose track of the blessings. I'm just going to pour you out from the windows of heaven so you have more, you don't have enough room to receive it all. But the blessings just seem to increase exponentially the more cheeks you turn. Because again, what does that do? It gives your enemy more and more evidence that they're the party at fault here. And that they aren't justified in attacking you because you never responded in kind. There's such a, a, an imbalance in the moral equilibrium. And that's a powerful thing. It's in the favor of the, it's in favor of the, the victim at the expense of the perpetrator. And everybody knows it. It's become crystal clear three times in. You see, verse 27, these three testimonies shall stand against your enemy if he repent not and shall not be blotted out. We talk about the law of witnesses, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Well, now you've got two or three evidences. Exhibit A, B, C. I didn't fight back. I didn't deserve those, what they were doing to me. Now, verse 28 it starts to change. Now, verily I say unto you, if that enemy shall escape my vengeance, that he be not brought into judgment before me. So if it seems like he's getting away with it, it's like, hey, three times, and they just keep turning cheeks. Man, I can do this, as, I can do this till the cows come home. Well, careful. If it seems that way, then here's what you do. Middle of 28. Then ye shall see to it that ye warn him in my name, that he come no more upon you, neither upon your family, even in your children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. We're going to see that phrase several more times later on. Because so often this can become intergenerational strife. This is the Hatfields versus the McCoys, right? This is, this is family feuds that all of a sudden, we can't even remember who started it because it was generations ago. But now we feel all the more justified because they keep fighting back. Well, they're saying the same thing about you. But in this case, if it seems like justice is never going to come, remind them that it someday will. And that it will come from God. You may be escaping mortal justice and judgment. There's no permanent escape from eternal justice and judgment. In fact, in the early days of, of the United States, there was even a law that atheists weren't allowed to testify in court. Because the thought was, if they don't trust in ultimate justice, then we can't trust them with, with proximate justice at all. Uh, they might lie to a judge and jury, and we won't know. There's no lie detector test. But God doesn't need one. And so if God is your ultimate judge, then... You'll think twice before you lie to a mortal jury. 
So as long as you have that in mind, and I love what the Lord is saying there in verse 28, if they, if they think they're going to get away with this, again, play to the better angels of their nature, remind them that there is ultimate justice, no matter what happens here. We're, we're still trying to give them time to come to their senses. We're trying to change hearts and turn hearts to fathers and to prophets and to better angels and, and so on. But what if that still doesn't work? Verse 29, Then if he shall come upon you, or your children, or your children's children, unto the third or fourth generations, I have delivered thine enemy into thine hands. Oh, okay, so fourth time's the charm? I turn three cheeks, warn him as he's about to hit my fourth, but if he ends up doing it despite that, if he is so blind to ultimate justice, that he has to have justice delivered right up close and personal, you won't wait for it, then you'll have to see it right now, then fine. Then you are justified in providing that justice since they assume that they'll never have to face the music. They can face it right now. They're in your hands. But notice verse 30 and 31, because even that has a caveat. The Lord is renouncing war and proclaiming peace himself over and over and over. And even when just war theory would say you're totally justified in going to battle to defend yourself, it's not an automatic. See verse 30, then if thou wilt spare him. Oh, so that's still an option? Oh yeah, of course, that's always an option. You can, you can turn every imaginable cheek. You can give them infinite witnesses until you are the martyr yourself, if you lay down your life in my cause. You can do that. And if you do, verse 30, thou shalt be rewarded for thy righteousness and also thy children and thy children's children unto the third and fourth generation. But you don't have to choose that. You could choose to defend yourself, verse 31, nevertheless, thine enemy is in thine hands. If thou rewardest him according to his works, thou art justified. You've met the criteria of just war theory. If he has sought thy life, and thy life is endangered by him, thine enemy is in thine hands, and thou art justified. Hmm, that's important to understand. But then again, that also kind of paints the picture of what would you prefer? Would you prefer earthly justice, or would you prefer eternal reward? Now, I'm not saying you're going to lose your eternal reward, uh, because you are justified in seeking, in seeking justice here on earth. Okay, But... But it might be a lesser reward. You know what I mean? It's, again, if we're looking at this exponential rise from 1 to 100 to 800 to, to generational blessings flowing, that, that does make me kind of, hmm, I might just keep on forgiving, <laughs> even when I'm justified in fighting back. Now, it's going to be up to every individual. At what point is it like, no, this, I... I have to defend myself, especially my family, and I'm justified in doing so. That's Captain Moroni. That is the sons of Mosiah, when they're like, I know you're, mm, you can fight back. I know you don't want to, and that's okay. The Nephite army can protect you. Uh, we haven't made the same covenant you had, and it's totally justified, the, the, your defense, and our fighting the Lamanites to do that. I just can't stand idly by and watch you get massacred over and over and over. And I would rather save you, even if another hundred or simply another thousand people get baptized after every massacre. Uh, as much as I love new converts, I can't stand to bury the old ones. So we, we're going to fight back. At least we Nephites will. Come and be behind our, our, our shield of faith. Okay. But that is the choice that we're all making. And then 32, it's interesting, this is a choice that's been made for a long time. Behold, this is the law I gave unto my servant Nephi, and thy fathers Joseph, and Jacob, and Isaac, and Abraham, and all mine ancient prophets and apostles. So no wonder King, uh, or Captain Moroni uh, functioned that way. This was, this was passed down from Nephi on down. When Nephi went as against Laman and Lemuel. And then unto the generations, children of the third and fourth generation, and then some. Uh, Captain Moroni functioned in that way. This is justified. I'll never be bloodthirsty, but I must. War is hell, and it's come to that. And same with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. I honestly wonder 
if this will help us understand a little bit more of the wars in the book of, jo of Joshua and Judges next year, in the con conquest of Canaan. Because it's, it's genocide, and we have such a hard time, uh, for good reason. Like, how could they do that? How could God command them to? Well, if it's part of this just war theory, and like God says to Abraham, the promised land is promised you, but you don't, it's not so much that you don't deserve it now, but it's the present occupants no, don't yet deserve to be, to be removed. They haven't defiled the land to the point of being spewed out, like we see in Deuteronomy. It's the, the wickedness of the Amorites is not yet full. You taking the promised land now, Abraham, you wouldn't be justified. Uh, by the time Joshua and uh, the judges come along, there may be justification. I even wonder, because according to the judges' version, they didn't completely, it wasn't genocide. It wasn't the genocide that, that, that uh, the book of Joshua suggests. There were still pockets of Canaanites all over the place. And some would say, well, that was them not being obedient to God. Perhaps. Then again, it might be them taking the other option of, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight the war even if it's justified. And that, again, that can go either way. We don't know enough of the detail behind it. Which, was it a good choice or was it a bad choice? Uh, was it making compromises with evil and spelling their own eventual disaster? Or was it an act of mercy on the Israelites' part? Because they're making a, a higher choice. I don't, historically, I don't know which of those is real. But either way, there's a lesson for me to learn in terms of how I deal with, with personal attacks for me or for my family. Now, verse 33, again, this is the law that I gave unto mine ancients, that they should not go out unto battle against any nation, kindred, tongue, or people, save I the Lord command them. So there's a law against offensive war uh, if you're just deciding unilaterally to go, to go to battle without God telling you that, yes, this is what needs to happen. So 33 is offensive war, and then 34 is defensive war. If any nation, tongue, or people should proclaim war against them, that they should first lift a standard of peace unto that people, nation, or tongue. So even if you're, the, 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 you're not the aggressor, and they're the ones attacking you, if they proclaim war, don't just go, fine, you're about to start it, so we're ready to you know, bring it on. It's like, no, still proclaim peace. Lift a standard of peace. This is the standard we're holding ourselves to. Will you hold yourself to that standard as well? This is our higher moral ground. If you're going to attack us, it's going to be coming from beneath, not from above. We'll have evidence of that. Verse 35, if that people did not accept the offering of peace, neither the second nor the third time, so again, we're trying to have by the mouth of two or three witnesses, then they should bring these testimonies before the Lord. Verse 36, then I, the Lord, would give unto them a commandment and justify them in going out to battle against that nation, tongue, or people. I justify them. This is the Lord's just war theory. Now, verse 37, I, the Lord, would fight their battles. I mean, you're justified in fighting. I am too, and I'll be on your side. I'll fight your battles, your children's battles, your children's children's battles, until they have avenged themselves on all their enemies to the third and fourth generation. You won't live that long to fight all those battles, but the Lord is eternal. He'll be there the whole way through. 38, Behold, this is an ensample unto all people, saith the Lord your God, for justification before me. And if just is the root word of that justification, justification almost begs the comparison to sanctification. And I think that's the choice that they were presented with, right? Uh, you, if fourth time you want to fight, you're justified in doing so. There's justification. But sanctification, they're still turning more cheeks. That's still renouncing war and proclaiming peace. That's still held, holding out hope. And even trusting that if worse comes to worse and there's martyrdom, well, there's still a martyr's crown on the other side. There's still a mansion prepared. It's interesting if the Lord were saying for sanctification before me instead of just for justification before me. Well, there's the two different levels. Then 39, again, verily I say unto you, if after thine enemy has come upon thee the first time, he repents and come unto thee praying thy forgiveness, thou shalt forgive him. 
and shall hold it no more as a testimony against thine enemy. So there seems to be some repetition here. We, I thought we already went through the one, two, three, four. Well, we did, but those were one, two, three, four instances of offense without repentance. Well, what if they did repent between those offenses? What do we do then? Well, according to verse 39, you don't even hold that against them later on. You don't like, well, I'm just going to keep this in my pocket to keep track in case we get to the third and fourth and so on. No, it's, you've, you've uh, released that witness. You're, no, you're not even going to call them to the stand. It's no more a testimony against thine enemy. Why? Because they repented and you forgave them. And I, the Lord, remember those sins no more, right? Verse 40, so on unto the second and third time. Okay, but, but fourth, right? I get to stop forgiving them after the fourth time they've sinned and repent. No, nope. keep reading in verse 40. And as oft as thine enemy repenteth of the trespass, wherewith he hath trespassed against thee, thou shalt forgive him until 70 times 7. And no, that doesn't justify you on time 491. You're supposed to lose track. Just like I lose track of my blessings. I just keep pouring them out. You see, there's a difference between the unrepentant and the, the repentant who just is unsuccessful at forsaking them permanently. If they slip again, if, but they keep trying. If God is merciful with us as we do that, then keep giving them additional chances. Like I said, the Lord does that for us. As often as my people repent, will I forgive them? King Mosiah said, well, here, as often as they repent to you, you should forgive them as well. Verse 41, if he trespass against thee and repent not the first time, nevertheless thou shalt forgive him. 42, if he trespass against thee the second time and repent not, nevertheless thou shalt forgive him. 43, if he trespass against thee the third time and repent not, Thou shalt also forgive him. So now he's just going back and repeating what he started with. It's again, are, are, the question is, are they repenting or not? Because as often as they repent, you should forgive. If it's the unrepentant that then it's still forgive. One, two, three. Have those three witnesses, those three bruised cheeks. On the fourth, you decide. That's what he gets at at 44. If he trespass against thee the fourth time, thou shalt not forgive him, but shall bring these testimonies before the Lord. And they shall not be blotted out until he repent and reward thee fourfold in all things wherewith he hath trespassed against thee. There is justice after all. And mercy will not rob justice of its due. Ultimately, they will have to repent. These three witnesses are staring them there, at, there in the courtroom and demanding that. Verse 45, if he do this. So it, it took a while. It, it was... Uh, too many offenses, and I, I was able to hold them responsible. I mean, this goes back to what we saw in section 64 about, of you it is required to forgive all men. But then he said, but you still do need to honor justice. Remember, we, we compared, you can't offend the Lord of love, but then again, you can't offend the Lord of law. And it's not because you're not merciful. It's not because you're not unforgiving. It's because, it's because mercy can grow unmerciful if it's not balance, as if the contrary isn't proven. So they're trying to balance that here as well. So again, 45, if he do this, thou shalt forgive him with all thine heart. If he do not this, I, the Lord, will avenge thee of thine enemy. An hundredfold. There's a lot of math in this, in this section. But notice it's the Lord avenging you. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He'll command you to fight back. You follow, just trust in him. Seek his counsel in all of these things. It's not an automatic thing. It, he needs to be involved in every decision. Verse 46, that continues multi-generationally also. Upon his children, upon his children's children, of all them that hate me unto the third and fourth generation. Hmm, it's not just hating you, it's hating me. Because they're not following my counsel. They're not living up to their better angels. They're not trusting their own prophets because all that... That, that wisdom and, and, and honesty and goodness is inspired of God ultimately. They're hating me. All, all, no wonder he's the one that, to avenge them. 47, if the children shall repent, or the children's children, and turn to the Lord their God with all their hearts and with all their might, mind, and strength, and restore fourfold for all their trespasses wherewith he have, they have trespassed, or wherewith their fathers have trespassed, or their fathers' fathers, then thine indignation shall be turned away. So there is a chance for a later Hatfield to apologize to a later McCoy. 
or vice versa. Uh, and God will honor that. It's amazing that he will, he doesn't hold children responsible for the sins of their parents. That's the second article of faith. But then again, if hearts of children can turn to their fathers, then perhaps, well, here, definitely, children can help make a difference and change the, the family tree, bend the branch back into, the, into place by renouncing war and proclaiming peace. By, and restitution is part of that repentance. Finally, 48, Vengeance shall no more come upon them, saith the Lord thy God, and their trespasses shall never be brought any more as a testimony before the, before the Lord against them. Amen. Well, of course they can't. Those, those witnesses don't even exist anymore. We never, we didn't hold on to them. We forgave. And so did the Lord. There's no more evidence against you. It's, it's all been washed away. Scarlet sin, now white as snow. Now, we could jump straight to section 101 here. Because the, the problems and persecution, I mean, the saints are beginning to, do, to follow this counsel and keep, they keep turning cheeks. But the, the, there's, they're running out of cheeks to turn. And things are getting, they're escalating. Remember when, they, when the leaders in Missouri, even full of fear, signed the agreement, we'll leave, just give us time to get everything ready? Well, eventually that's not, they, the Missourians don't hold true to that promise. And they begin escalating things. Again, there seems to be a suggestion like, I don't know if they're really gonna, those Mormons are really going to leave. Uh, people are still gathering here. And, and uh, I mean, forbid, heaven forbid they actually show any kind of evidence that they want to do something as permanent as building a temple here. Oh. And so the Missourians escalate their mobocracy and begin forcing them out uh, later on in, the, in, in 1833, even before the the timeline hit, the, the deadline of you got to be out of, out of town. And 101 comes in response to that. So section 98 jumped to section 101 and our history of persecution in Missouri, it goes without a, uh, it goes un uninterrupted. Well, but there is an interruption, namely section 99 and 100. And I'm so grateful for those, that these interruptions. They're two fairly brief revelations and they both have to do with missionary work. And that to me says something, that it, within these bookends of persecution, well, the work needs to go on. We're not going to put missions on hold just because all hell's breaking loose. We still got to spread heaven, okay? And despite a pandemic, we're still going to send out missionaries, even if they're, they're serving from home and online, and we're still going to learn things. They're going to preach the gospel. Uh, the kingdom of God rolls forth. And here we see evidence of that. In section 99, a mission call is given to John Murdoch. Even Murdoch himself, his story is almost synonymous with persecution. Because it was, he, he was the one whose wife passed away in giving birth to twins. Around the same time that Emma gave birth to twins and survived when, when the, the twins did not. Uh, and then, unsure, what do I do with these babies that I can't even feed? Uh, Joseph and Emma adopt those two twins from John Murdoch to replace their own. Just a sweet, I mean, talk about consecration on the part of family, right? Uh, and it was a blessing for both Brother Murdoch and for Joseph and Emma. I love the names, by the way, because John Murdoch loved uh, Joseph Smith so much that he named his son Joseph Smith Murdoch and his daughter Julia Murdoch. But it's funny that when the, when the twins get adopted by Joseph and Emma, well, then his name would be Joseph Smith Murdoch Smith. <laughs> so you get two Smiths in there now. Uh, but, just, uh, and, but here's the thing about persecution. Because when Joseph Smith is dragged out by a mob in the cold of a winter night in, in Hiram, Ohio, uh, tarred and feathered himself, Sidney Rigdon head bouncing along the ground as he's being dragged by his heels, uh, there's the, because of the exposure as they break into the cabin and, and these babies, these newborns are exposed to that, uh, little Joseph Smith, Murdoch Smith, ends up dying. Partly from measles, but most likely also partly from that exposure that night. He's a little, his is a, a little martyr's crown. And so John Murdoch is, bears the brunt of a lot of that. Well, here he is called on another mission, and he serves... If there was ever a guy that just served mission after mission, it's John Murdoch. 
and the revelation comes to him, 99 verse 1, Behold, thus saith the Lord unto my servant John Murdoch, Thou art called to go into the eastern countries, from house to house, from village to village, from city to city. Kind of get an escalation there, right? Start in the house. Go to the village. Go to the city. And proclaim mine everlasting gospel unto the inhabitants thereof in the midst of persecution and wickedness. I'm not saying this blindly. Like, I, I had no idea what, that hard things were going on in your life. Just go out and serve. No, this is... This is people being called at the worst possible time. This is bishops or Relief Society presidents serving not because things at home are so easy, but precisely despite the fact that the things at home are so hard. I get it. I know. Remember, those, the, your prayers have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. I, I'm aware. I am omniscient. But despite the persecution and wickedness all around you, despite the hard things, I'm calling you to be bishop right now, even when things at home are hard. I'm calling you to serve at the least convenient time. John, go. It will be a blessing to you as well as to those that you preach to. Verse 2, who receiveth you receiveth me. That kind of oath and covenant of the priesthood language. And you shall have power to declare my word in the demonstration of my Holy Spirit. There's a mission for you. Have power, not just preaching. To have the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Oh, they don't need to come seeking signs. The signs will present themselves. They'll honor their faith. The Spirit will demonstrate the power of the things that you're sharing. Verse 3, who receiveth you as a little child receiveth my kingdom, and blessed are they, for they shall obtain mercy. Speaking of just war theory, well, mercy being offered to those that will accept as little children, if they'll be humble enough. Verse 4, on the other hand, whoso rejecteth you shall be rejected of my father and his house, and you shall cleanse your feet in the secret places, by the way, for a testimony against them. Don't do it right on their doorstep. Don't be like, oh yeah, you're slamming the door on me. I'm going to slam the door on you. It's like, no, but, but God will judge. Leave it in his capable hands. And behold, verse 5, and lo, I come quickly to judgment. That's why you can afford to leave it in my hands. I'll take care of it. To convince all of their ungodly deeds which they have committed against me, as it is written of me in the volume of the book. Interesting, again, this idea of self-deception and how much we... We try to convince ourselves that what we're doing isn't wrong. Well, someday we'll be cured of that misconception. And it's the Lord himself that will help us see. I mean, with that brilliant noonday light, it's going to bring out all the shadows. With that perfect whiteness, any dark streak, it will no longer be a shade of gray. We'll know with perfection before us every imperfection that remains will be undeniable to us. The ungodly will be convinced of their ungodly deeds. Then in verse 6, Now verily I say unto you that it is not expedient that you should go until your children are provided for and sent up kindly unto the bishop of Zion. See, that had been a problem on an earlier mission. He had, there were five kids in the Murdoch family. The twins were the youngest two. But he had three older children and when he went on a mission earlier, it was kind of like, okay, kids, good luck. Uh, and he kind of farmed them out, and families cared for them, but they assumed that they would be paid for their, for their pains. Uh, this isn't free babysitting here. Um, and so when John Murdoch comes back from a mission, they're like, whoa, okay, this is what you owe. And he's like, what? And so this time, it's like, can, look, can we do, let's, let's prepare a little bit better this time, shall we? Uh, go on this mission to the east, and that's exactly where he goes. But before you go, make sure you're... I remember section 83, children have claim upon their parents for their maintenance. Maintain them, please. Okay? And make sure that they're provided for. And that's exactly what he did. Then verse 7, After a few years, if thou desirest of me, thou mayest go up also unto the goodly land to possess thine inheritance. I mean, if he's sending them to the Bishop of Zion, that's kind of cool. Most other people are like, no, no, stay in Kirtland. Prepare yourself. Become a, a Zion people before you head to the Zion place. But these wonderful children, you go, go. 
and the Bishop of Zion will provide for you. Go, go talk to Bishop Partridge. He'll make sure that there are people that can be part of their stewardship. You're responsible for the blacksmith shop and this Murdoch child. You run this farm and Joseph, or John Murdoch's daughter. Uh, and then John will be able to return. And when he's ready, when he desires it, he'll have a spot waiting for him in Zion as well. Otherwise, verse 8, and this is an interesting otherwise. It's like, what if I don't want to go quite yet? Not, nothing against my children, obviously. But this is like John the Beloved. Peter, I want to come to you as quickly as possible. He got the verse 7 version. As soon as you desire it, go to the goodly land. Verse 8 is the John version. I just want to keep serving. And so verse 8, Otherwise thou shalt continue proclaiming my gospel until thou be taken. Amen. I mean, you want to talk about an extended mission call. You, whenever you're ready, you can go on to Zion. But if you want to stay and serve, you can do it until you're taken, if you choose. Uh, John Murdoch served this mission. He'd served earlier missions. He served later missions. He became the first mission president in Australia, I think in the 1850s. Uh, later returned uh, to, and settled in, in Utah with the saints when they gathered there. Just a wonderful, wonderful lifelong missionary, lifelong servant of the Lord, in spite of persecution and wickedness all around him, in spite of hard things. He did. Halverson's do hard things? Well, whatever. John Murdoch did hard things. Those early saints did so many of them. Well, there's 99. 100, similarly, another mission. But this one is for Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon. Hmm. So, yeah, it's not just run the church. It's increase. It's not just beautify Zion. It's also enlarge its borders, right? And so while you're spending most of your time perfecting the saints as you, the work of the ministry and, and translating the, the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible and, and all those other things that the first presidency is supposed to be doing, well, there's still missions for you also. So go out and share. And that's what they're doing. In section 100, uh, Joseph and Sidney, in the midst of all these crazy things going on in both Kirtland and Nauvoo, they go to Perrysburg, New York. It's about 150 miles up the coast of Lake Erie. Uh, and actually the field was white already to harvest in western New York. Lots of, I mean, we think, at least I always did, it's like, no, if you're a Latter-day Saint, there's only two choices for you. You live in Kirtland or you live in Independence. Well, those were the two gathering places, but there really were branches of the church. You know, one of a city, two of a family, and coming to Zion. But before they gather, it's these little pockets of spiritual strength, these tiny branches of the church all over the place. And Joseph and Sidney are serving in one of those in, in western New York. Now, as they're out serving, they can't help but worry about their families. I mean, the, peop the people suffering in Missouri, well, what about our family? Well, let me tell you about your family. Here's just war theory. Well, Joseph and Sidney out serving the Lord's children. Well, what about our children? We're caring for yours. Is anybody caring for ours? They do have claim on us for their maintenance. Well, this beautiful reassurance comes in section 100. In fact, it couldn't have come at a better time. In Joseph's diary, he wrote, I feel very well in my mind the Lord is with us, but have much anxiety about my family. And that was the exact same day this revelation came a little while later. It was weighing on him. It was, I don't know if it was a P day and his mind just kind of wandered home. Happened to be on P day sometimes. Uh, but just wondering, are they doing okay? I actually had a mission companion, amazing guy, only member in his family. He joined the church in the Philippines where he was born and raised and and then left it all to go serve the Lord. And I just remember when we served together, there were times he just really worried about his family back home and wished that they would accept the gospel or wished they understood better what he was doing. And, and I just remember at times as we talked, just your, while you're caring for God's family, trust that God is caring for yours. And that's exactly the reassurance that Joseph and Sidney receive in section 100. Verse 1, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my friends, Sidney and Joseph, your families are well. It's okay. I'm aware of them. They are in mine hands, and I will do with them as seemeth me good, for in me there is all power. You sense a bit of omniscience and omnipotence there also? They're well. I, 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 you can't see what's going on. I've got a great view from upstairs. Everything's fine. 
and they're in my hands. There's my omnipotence. Everything will go, it will all work together for their good, your good, my name's glory. It's going to be fine. So, verse 2, therefore, follow me and listen to the counsel which I shall give unto you. Let your mind be at ease concerning them. Let's focus on you and the task at hand. Verse 3, Behold and lo, I have much people in this place, in the regions round about, and an effectual door shall be opened in the regions round about in this eastern land. And that's exactly what was happening. The field really was white. They were harvesting well. The church was growing in that part of the vineyard. An effectual door was opened. Uh, I, every time I help somebody move, I think to myself, how come people who design doorways don't talk to the people who design furniture? Ah, and every time you have to you know, pop the hinges and pull off a door just so it'll fit through the door jam, it's like, a couple inches would have helped. <laughs> well, there are doors out there that aren't very effective, or in this word, effectual. But I love that the Lord is reassuring and promising them as missionaries. The door that will be open to these eastern lands will be big enough for the converts to stream through. Big enough for you to share your message through. It will be an effectual door. Verse 4, Therefore I, the Lord, have suffered you to come unto this place. For thus it was expedient in me for the salvation of souls. Interesting, on the one hand, it's expedient. But on the other hand, he suffered it. He allowed it. Sounds like it's like there's certain work that I just really need you to do, but I'm going to let you learn. I'm going to let you grow up in God. I'm going to let you be agents unto yourselves and exercise some choice in the matter. And so it's not that I forced you here. It's not that I caused you here. It's I allowed you to come. You were just kind of stumbled along, or, or better yet, you sought my inspiration. And how about Perrysburg? I don't know. Let's try it there. And I allowed that because it was expedient. Thank you for following divine direction. Verse 5, Therefore, verily I say unto you, lift up your voices unto this people, speak the thoughts that I shall put into your hearts, and you shall not be confounded before men. Of course you won't be confounded. You're speaking what God in his omniscience is, is inspiring you with. And notice it's what I shall put into your hearts. I think it's Jacob and Samuel the Lamanite, if I remember correctly, that similar words are used of them where it's, go preach. Go preach the things I'll give you. And it's like, um, would you mind giving them to me now so I can prepare? Uh, I can kind of wrap my head around it. I mean, opening your mouth and letting it be filled in the moment? How about open my, my notebook and you can fill it in advance? Uh, then I, I can go into the, the actual teaching moment far better prepared. No, I'm not saying don't go in prepared. But I am saying, if God says, take no thought beforehand, then don't hold back. Just go and open your mouth, and the filling will, will come. Verse 6, for it shall be given you in the very hour. Yea, in the very moment, what you shall say. I'm so glad the Lord clarifies. Because the very hour... That was like me in junior high when somebody ripped on me on the playground. And like an hour later, I had this awesome comeback, but so I missed my chance. Yeah, hour? Hmm. I think we talked about that like in section 26, I think, where it's like some blessings happen in the very moment, others in the very hour, and others in the due time of the Lord. And then in verse 7, But a commandment I give unto you that ye shall declare whatsoever thing ye declare in my name, it's coming from me, not from you, in solemnity of heart, so this isn't some kind of gotcha moment, it's not comebacks and digs I'm giving you. I'm not trying to help you Bible bash. I mean, I'm just trying to help you respond in a loving and kind and inspired way so that you're not confounded by them. So do it in solemnity of heart. Do it in the spirit of meekness, again, not of pride or of contention, in all things. That's how we should be sharing the gospel. And verse 8, I give unto you this promise, that inasmuch as ye do this, the Holy Ghost shall be shed forth in bearing record unto all things whatsoever ye shall say. Of course the Spirit's going to bear witness of these things. He's the one that inspired you to say it in the first place. It's like with John Murdoch. This will be according to the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, same thing here. The Spirit's telling you what to say. Of course he's going to confirm that what you said was true. He is the source of it, after all. Verse 9, it is expedient in me that you, 
My servant Sidney should be a spokesman unto this people. Yea, verily, I will ordain you unto this calling, even to be a spokesman unto my servant Joseph. I mean, Sidney was the more, oh, he was, he was the polished preacher of the two. This actually reminds me a lot of what we saw a few years ago in the Doctrine and Covenants. It might feel like a few years ago for us. Early on in the year when we were talking about, I mean, Joseph's second-hand man was Oliver Cowdery. And it was, remember section 28, it's like Joseph will be the Moses in the relationship and Oliver will be the Aaron in the relationship. And that fits because Joseph's a revelator, but Aaron was a better spokesman. Uh, Aaron, uh, Oliver Cowdery was more educated. And so to be able to explain things and teach things, that's, that was his gift. Parting the heavens and receiving the revelation, that was Joseph's. Well, if you thought Oliver Cowdery was good, uh, a school teacher of a background, well, he couldn't hold a candle to... Sidney Rigdon, uh, Baptist and then Campbellite preacher background. I mean, he, he was made for this kind of stuff. So a spokesman for Joseph, please, you'll be ordained to that calling. Then 10, back to Joseph, I will give unto him. See, he's saying you, Sidney, him, Joseph. That's how we keep them straight. So you, Sidney, you'll be the spokesman unto Joseph. Him, Joseph, I'll give him power to be mighty in testimony. He might not be able to explain and expound things quite as, as eloquently as Sidney Rigdon, but in terms of the power of his testimony, I mean, he lived it. I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, so I could not deny it. There's something about Joseph's testimony that was undeniable. It, he was mighty in testimony. And then 11, I will give unto thee, Sidney, power to be mighty in expounding all scriptures, that thou mayest be a spokesman unto him. Again, that's your spiritual gift and lots of professional experience. And he, Joseph, shall be a revelator unto thee, Sidney, that thou mayest know the certainty of all things pertaining to the things of my kingdom on the earth. This is, this is a good companionship, okay? Uh, like, like the companionships I had on my mission. We, we knew our spiritual gifts. We, we honored the spiritual gifts of one another. Uh, and And... It's amazing when you have kind of these clearly defined roles. When you think of a basketball team, you know, and, and, and it's like, no, you're the point guard. I'm the shooting guard. Or you're the, this. We all have our roles to play. And Joseph, you're the revelator and the testifier. Sidney, you're the spokesman. You're the, the expounder. You remember back in section 35 when Sidney Rigdon is called upon to help Joseph be a scribe for the, trans, the, the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible? He was also told this at the end of that revelation, call on the holy prophets to prove his, Joseph's, words as they shall be given him. You catch that? I love that phrase, call on the holy prophets. You know them like the back of your hand. Uh, you could list every book of the Bible and probably quote half of the stuff that they said, and that's good. That's what preachers in the 19th century did. They knew their stuff. Uh, but for Joseph to reveal God's stuff, and then people are like, well, wait, where'd you get that? Show me chapter and verse. And I mean, Joseph masters the Bible through the JST, but he didn't know it very well beforehand. And so it was left to a Sidney Rigdon where it's like, uh, they're like, show me chapter and verse where he says that. And Joseph's like, uh, book of Joseph Smith, chapter two, you know, and the Sidney's like, no, 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 I, I, I got this, Joseph. That's actually just like what Peter taught in second Peter chapter four, or, oh, that, that's, I mean, you've read 1 Corinthians 15. Come on, what Joseph is describing here is, is spelled out beautifully there. And I love this division of labor. Again, we see it here in section 100 where it's like missionary companions where one is the more of the social gift and the other has more of the intellectual gift. One is the, uh, the extrovert and the other is the introvert. It's a great combination because the extrovert can get in the door and then the introvert can really teach. It's like, I don't really know the scriptures as well as you do, but I know people. Uh, and vice versa. It's like, I can explain all this stuff to him if I just had the courage to start a conversation. Well, tag team. Yeah, great companionships. And that's Joseph and Sidney for you. Then verse 12, Therefore, continue your journey and let your hearts rejoice. Just let it. I've given you that reassurance. Your family is fine. So let your hearts be comforted. Submit. Let your hearts rejoice. For behold and lo, I am with you even unto the end. Yeah, talk about great companionship. It's not just the twosome, it's the trio. Joseph, Sidney, and the Lord. Yeah, senior companion there. In verse 13, 
And now I give unto you a word concerning Zion. Uh, you see, it's not just your immediate family that you're worried about, Joseph and Sydney. I'm sure it's your church family too. And while you're out trying to, to keep things going in Kirtland and then even leave there to go spread the gospel in western New York, but your heart and mind is still off in western uh, Missouri wondering what's going on there, well, let me give you a word concerning Zion. Zion shall be redeemed. There's the good news. And here's the bad. Although she is chastened for a little season. Remember the Lord has said this before, I chasten those that I love, and boy, do I love you. <laughs> and boy, do you need to be chastened. Zion will be chastened. She's got some things to work on. It's not just the Missourians' fault. It's the Latter-day Saints' fault because they're not quite saintly yet. So I'll chasten them. But they will be redeemed. There's my immutable covenant. Verse 14, thy brethren, my servants Orson Hyde and John Gould, are in my hands. Inasmuch as they keep my commandments, they shall be saved. So God sees the big picture, like Zion in 13. He sees the small picture, like Orson and John in 14. He's aware of all of these situations. Verse 15, therefore let your hearts be comforted, for all things shall work together for good. To them that walk uprightly, to the sanctification of the church, it's what we saw in section 98. It's what we saw in Romans chapter 8. Just trust me. I see the big picture. And it's, it's coming along beautifully. Verse 16, For I will raise up unto myself a pure people that will serve me in righteousness. And all that call upon the name of the Lord and keep his commandments shall be saved. Even so, amen. You understand this chastening? You understand being tried and proven in all things? You understand going through the furnace of affliction to, to burn out the dross, to separate out the chaff from among the wheat? My ultimate goal is a pure people. Because how did he define Zion back in section 90, 97? This is Zion, the pure in heart, all capital letters. I, I'm trying to raise up unto myself a pure people. I'm trying to coach a team and it's hard to make saints out of sinners. It's hard, it's hard to, to become Zion. It's hard to grow up in God. But that is the goal. And I'm not giving up on you or on the process. So just keep calling upon my name. Keep, keep my commandments. You'll be saved individually. Joseph or Sidney or Orson or John. Collectively, Zion itself. That's what it's all about. Now, thank you, God, for that reassurance. Thank you for comforting me concerning my family. Thank you for reiterating your promises concerning Zion. And I don't mean, I, don't, I hope I don't seem ungrateful or unfaithful, but I still have questions about what to do in independence. Because the saints by now have been driven out of Jackson County. See, by section 101, it's now December of 1833. The, the turmoil of July, so-called Independence Month, the jumping of the gun before next spring when we were supposed to have to leave, by December, saints have been driven out. It's the mini extermination order. Okay, the preview of coming expulsions. And the saints are scattered in other counties uh, starting to gather in, in wherever they can find, but, but they all know, it does, in some ways, I mean, there's uh, Ray County and Clay County and all, all these other counties that the saints are, are going to, Van Buren and, uh, and elsewhere, you see uh, some of them mentioned in the chapter, section heading. But in some ways, if you have a hard time remembering all those other counties, there's a reason for that. None of them were designated by God as the center place. Uh, some were designated by the Missourians. They were even kind of hoping, let's create a Mormon county and kind of contain the contagion. And even though Joseph is reassured that, yes, someday Zion will be redeemed, the question is, how long is this chastening season going to last? And yeah, I understand about law and I understand about just war, but the, when the rubber hits the road, what do you want us to do? I am losing track of the cheeks that we've turned. So what are we justified? What do you want us to do? And honestly, Joseph doesn't know. 
And he admits that. I, to those who sometimes want to say, oh, Joseph's making all this stuff up. And it was just his charisma and his overconfidence and his, his bravado to say, oh, thus saith the Lord, even though I'm speaking for myself. No, just like he was very oh, open with his flaws and canonizes his own mistakes in the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, he was very open with his ignorance when it was there. He was just as open with, I know what God wants us to do, as he was with, I don't know what God wants us to do right here. And so he says this, I have always expected that Zion would suffer some affliction. I mean, he would have known that from things like section 100, right? She shall be chastened for a little season. We would have known that from section 98. Uh, it's good to be tried and proven. So I always expected that from what I could learn from the commandments which have been given. I mean, Joseph remembers his scriptures pretty well too, okay? But, he goes on, I would remind you of a certain clause in one which says that after much tribulation cometh the blessing. I love that Joseph is holding on to the scriptures. He knows it comes from God. It's not like, well, I said this, so I'm sticking to it. It's like, no, God reassured us. He promised us this. I keep reading the scriptures. He said, by this and also others, there's been other scriptural reassurances too, and also one received of late. Maybe, I bet that's section 100, okay? It'll be redeemed. I know that Zion in the due time of the Lord will be redeemed. But how many will be the days of her purification, tribulation, and affliction? The Lord has kept hid from my eyes. And when I inquire concerning the subject, so yeah, Joseph's been wondering, he's been asking, the voice of the Lord is, be still and know that I am God. All those who suffer for my name shall reign with me, and he that layeth down his life for my sake shall find it again. Same kind of reassurance we saw in 98. We'll see it again in 101. And then Joseph says this. It's amazing because about a week later, he receives section 101, which is exactly what he's been hoping and waiting for and, and not yet receiving. But he writes this, Now there are two things of which I am ignorant, and the Lord will not show them unto me, perhaps for a wise purpose in himself, I mean in some respects. And here's the two questions. And honestly, they're the same two questions we always ask when we're suffering. There's how Joseph put it. First, why God has suffered so great a calamity to come upon Zion, and what the great moving cause of this great affliction is? Isn't that our first question? God, why? Why is this happening to me? And then second, and again, by what means he will return her back to her inheritance with songs of everlasting joy upon her head? So that's the number. I love it. It's the same two questions we always ask. Why is this happening? And how do I get out of this fix? What should I be doing in the meantime to, to navigate the, the, the difficulties I'm in? Well, Joseph ends this little intro. He says, these two things, brethren, are in part kept back that they are not plainly shown unto me. But there are some things that are plainly manifest, which have incurred the displeasure of the Almighty. So I, I don't know all the solutions. I do know clearly some of the problems. I do know some of the reasons God is angry, but, but I want to know, know more. Why is it happening and what should we do? And like I said, a week later, section 101 comes and it answers both questions as we study it, and this is a long one, I, it, I, I won't be able to uh, delve too deep in every single uh, phrase because of the, the, its length, but pay attention, have an eye out for those two things. Why are they suffering and what should they do? Verse 1, Verily I say unto you concerning your brethren who have been afflicted and persecuted and cast out from the land of their inheritance. Uh, they're the ones that are on your mind, well, they're on my mind too. Verse 2, I, the Lord, have suffered the affliction to come upon them, wherewith they have been afflicted, in consequence of their transgressions. So notice, I suffered it to come upon them. I didn't send it myself. Uh, not all that we suffer is because of God's doing. Remember, we're punished by our sins more than for them. Punishing, being punished for them is God imposing some kind of a, a condemnation. Uh, punished by them, it's like you sowed the wind and you're reaping the whirlwind. You, you reaped what you sowed. You, it's the yo-yo principle. You send it out and it's coming right back. To quote Tevye, you spit in the air and it lands in your face. Uh, you, you brought it upon yourself. And 
you know what? I allowed it to happen because you, by your actions, you allowed me to leave. Or not even that, you forced me to. Remember he kept saying that? I will dwell among you. My glory will be there because my temple will be there. Well, you didn't, you didn't carve out space for me. And so how was I to be there to protect you? To be your shield and your rearward? I suffered it to come because of your transgressions. Verse 3, Yet I will own them, and they shall be mine in that day when I shall come to make up my jewels. Great reassurance from the start. It's your fault to quit blaming the Missourians. Where much was given, much was required, and you know better. The Missourians don't. You, you're bringing this upon your own heads, but I'll own you. I'm not going to own that behavior, but once you eliminate that behavior and choose me as your God, then I can finally choose you as my people. That'll all happen by the time I make up my jewels. I love that he, he calls them that. You are my precious stones, but how do you make jewels often? How do you make a diamond? You take a chunk of coal. And sadly, that's all that a lot of these Latter-day Saints were at the start. You were supposed to get a little purified in Kirtland before you go down to Missouri, but you jumped the gun. That's all right. There's, I can do a lot with coal, believe me. Give me enough time and enough heat and enough pressure. And as I prove you and try you, in, and as you wait patiently upon the Lord, someday you will be a jewel worth fixing into my crown. Verse 4, therefore they must needs be chastened and tried, even as Abraham, who was commanded to offer up his only son. Now this is one of the first instances in the Doctrine and Covenants where the Lord is drawing a parallel between what the saints are going through and what Abraham was called to go through. A gut-wrenching trial. I, I did a research paper years ago on trying to make sense of how Joseph saw Abraham and how he saw himself in the story of Abraham. And I'm amazed. Uh, if you remember Joseph Smith's history when he says, I, I was persecuted all the time for telling the stories of the, of the first vision, sharing that ex experience. And he said, but I felt like Paul. And they made fun of Paul. They tried to get Paul to deny it, but he couldn't. He knew it was true, and so do I. There are times when Joseph is persecuted that he's like, I'm, I'm feeling like Paul today. But so often when Joseph is suffering, and especially when the saints are suffering, his mind instinctively went to Father Abraham. At one point he even says, why are we going through all these hard things? It's so that we can be weighed in an even balance with Abraham. It's almost like he's saying, someday we're going to have to pull up a chair next to Abraham, kind of getting to know you today on, on, in the spirit world. And I don't want to feel like an idiot when I'm next to him. Can you imagine that? You're like, hey, I'm new, I'm new here, just died recently, and... You look like you've been here a while. Uh, who are you? Oh, my name's Abraham. Oh, great. Do you have a last name? Nope. Oh, you mean like Abraham, Abraham? Like the Abraham? Whoa. It's an honor to meet you. Would, would, would you sign my scriptures? Uh, and I just picture Abraham like uncomfortable with the attention. Like, well, I mean, you're here. You must have done something amazing. And I just really wonder what will go across our mind in that exact moment. Like, uh, what did I do? on par with Abraham. Um, I walked to church once when my car was out of gas. It was just a couple blocks away. Uh, <laughs> you know, right then the, the pioneers walked by and they're like, cross the plains. And you're all, ah! Uh, oh, I served a mission. I mean, two years I went out and served. And right then the sons of Mosiah walked by, 14! Or Noah, 120! You're like, ugh! Uh, what have I done to be weighed in the balance I always think about that with my father-in-law, that if he ever meets Job in the spirit world, he will be able to pull up a chair and go, you thought you had it bad. Let me tell you my life story. Well, for Joseph to pull up a chair next to Abraham, he'll, be, have, a, he'll have a story to tell. He'll be able to say, because we talk about Abrahamic tests. We talk, talk about Abrahamic uh, trials or Abrahamic faith or the Abrahamic covenant. I mean, you know you've arrived when your name becomes an adjective, when it goes from Abraham to Abrahamic. And the saints here were going through an, Ab an Abrahamic test. And, and they're being told that here. In, when Joseph's in Liberty Jail, he thinks the same thing. 
And he even starts to, he writes the saints a letter and talks about, I know that God will provide a ram in the thicket. I don't know how, but he'll come through for us just like he came through for Abraham. So many times, there, there seems to be just, within this cloud of witnesses, there seems to be an inner circle of dispensation heads. And Joseph's like, oh yeah, Moses, I get you. And, and Peter, I understand you. And Jesus, I know you well as you have introduced yourself to me. Father Adam, oh yeah, we have some interesting things in common. Enoch, he, Joseph chooses Enoch as his like code name when he's trying to keep his identity uh, covered in some of the revelations that, that he's worried about other people attacking him for. But Abraham, oh, there's a special connection between Joseph and Abraham within this inner circle and the cloud of witnesses. It's a beautiful thing. He was commanded to offer up his only son. What will he ask us to offer? What, what, what I don't know, but whatever it is, will we give it to him? Verse 5, for all those who will not endure chastening, but deny me, you can't be sanctified. Because it's, the, it's that heat and that pressure and that time that turns the coal to diamond. It's what makes us jewels in the crown of God. We can't be sanctified in other ways. We might be justified by retaliation after a certain... Uh, criteria is met, but sanctification, man, we're going to have to become more holy. We're going to have to become more Christ-like, who did lay down his life for his friends. Verse 6, Behold, I say unto you, there were jarrings and contentions and envyings and strifes and lustful and covetous desires among them. Therefore, by these things, they polluted their inheritances. And remember that verse in Deuteronomy, that if you defile the land, if it's polluted, then the land will spew you out. You get vomited. I mean, I don't know if there's much volcanic activity in, in, in middle America, in Missouri, but the land did spew out Latter-day Saints that had polluted the land of their inheritance. How could it be the promised land if they weren't living up to God's promises, if they weren't keeping their own promises to God? And like I keep saying about Zion people versus Zion place, Zion attitude versus Zion address, Zion lifestyle versus Zion location, compare verse 6 to the definition of Zion we keep coming back to from, from Enoch's experience. Zion was of one heart and one mind. Then what's up with the jarrings and contentions and strife? Zion dwelt in righteousness. What's up with lustfulness or the detestable things he mentioned back in, in 98? Zion, there was no poor among them? Then what's up with covetous desires? Oh yeah, you polluting your inheritance? You polluted yourself. You're not a Zion people. You cannot dwell in a Zion place. I mean, the First Presidency even wrote a letter and sent it to the saints in Missouri back in July, when even before all this, the chaos was taking place. And they said this, If we, by our wickedness, bring evil on our own heads, the Lord will let us bear it till we get weary and hate iniquity. I mean, that's, it doesn't get much more straightforward than that. We have to get to the point where we're sick and tired of sin. And often it's by dealing with its consequences that wake us up to the realities of what we're doing to ourselves. Again, quit blaming the Missourians. Are they to blame? Oh, partially. But you've got, you're, you're paying the piper too. Verse 7, they were slow to hearken unto the voice of the Lord their God. I never got, quite got around to building that temple. Therefore, the Lord their God is slow to hearken unto their prayers, to answer them in the day of their trouble. It's only fitting. Verse 8, in the day of their peace, they esteemed lightly my counsel. But in the day of their trouble, oh, of necessity, they feel after me. Interesting, they would feel after him because they can't see him. Yeah, you've brought on the mist of darkness in Lehi's dream, and it's, it's cloudy in your vision of everything, but then feel your way along this iron rod, or as Nephi said, multitudes feeling their way to that great and spacious building. It's feeling either way. Uh, darkness clouds the view of us all. But why are they feeling after God now? Well, because there's, there's no other option. It's of necessity. Trouble has awakened them to that. You see, it was apathy and ease, and then it became impatience in opposition. 
I mean, when are you going to get it right? When are we going to, when am I going to get it right? I, I suffer through the same thing sometimes. And it's like, come on, God, when are you going to listen to me? And he's like, <laughs> can we turn, can we turn that? And can you please listen to yourself? When are you going to listen to me? Uh, better question was never asked, son. Esteeming lightly my counsel. Well, I didn't think you meant it. I mean, ah, prepare for tribulation. I, that was just kind of theoretical. I didn't think tribulation was actually going to come. No, I, 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 did, I meant it. I, I don't give any commandments just for the heck of it. I give commandments for the heaven of it. Uh, I, I, th there's a reason behind every single one. And if you treat those things lightly until it's too late, and then you realize that's why God told me to do that all that time ago. And it's too late. You should have been preparing long before it became obvious that you needed it. There's a great quote from Howard W. Hunter where he said that if prayer is only a spasmodic cry at the time of crisis, is that that describes prayer pretty well? A spasmodic cry. It's like we're in the middle of something hard and it's this, this spasm where it's like almost uncontrollable. Like, help me, God. It's like, oh, yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten. I thought you forgot who I was. It'd been so long since we communicated. Well, if prayer is only a spasmodic cry at the time of crisis, then it is utterly selfish. And we come to think of God as a repairman or a service agency to help us only in our emergencies. And that is, that is selfish. In fact, it's totally unfair. I mean, do we ever feel a twinge of, am I in any place to ask him for help? Where, I mean, go back to how we started in section 98. Are you expressing thanks in all things, even the hard things? Are you letting your heart be comforted? Are you rejoicing evermore? Do we have a relationship? Or am I your 9-1 dispatch? Am I your butler and you just, oh, Jeeves, come, uh, feed me, uh, help me, save me, forgive me. No, we need a better relationship than that. Now verse 9, Verily I say unto you, notwithstanding your sins. So even though you deserve what you're getting, my bowels are filled with compassion towards them. I will not utterly cast them off. In the day of wrath, I will remember mercy. I know you don't deserve my mercy, but I'll give it to you. I know you haven't called and or you haven't listened to me quickly, but I'll listen to you more quickly than you deserve. There needs to be some justice with this mercy. There needs to be some proving and, and some consequences to your choice. That's part of agency too, but, but I will not utterly cast you off my bowels, my guts. I feel it deeply. It's part of my condescension, compassion, suffer with. Condescend, come down with. It's the with part, the con and the com. I can't help but love you, <laughs> even when you don't deserve it. I can't help but be compassionate because I know what you're going through. I went through similar things myself, even when I didn't deserve it. I chose to. Verse 10, I have sworn now we're back to this language of guarantee. And the decree hath gone forth by a former commandment, which I have given unto you, that I would let fall the sword of mine indignation in behalf of my people. And even as I have said, it shall come to pass. Now this isn't indignant at my people. It's indignant in behalf of my people. So I, I'm going to chasten and try you, but I'm also going to redeem and preserve and protect you from the enemies around you. See, there's an enemy within. That's what I'm getting at first. You've got to overcome those jarrings and contentions and strife and covetousness and envy and all that kind of stuff. But I will also come down with wrath and indignation on those that surround you. I will preser preserve and protect you from the enemies without. you just got to work on the enemies within first. Verse 11, Mine indignation is soon to be poured out without measure upon all nations. And this will I do when the cup of their iniquity is full. I mean, there's echoes of section 87, right? Wars poured out upon all, upon all nations. Here, it's when the cup of their in iniquity is full, just like the cup of the Amorites is not yet full. Uh, God is still in the process of turning cheeks and amassing enough evidence, calling enough witnesses, being on high moral ground. I mean, he is the high moral ground. But you understand, uh, there's be it's become, becoming clearer and clearer that the world will will be deserving of what it, what it endures. In verse 12, in that day, all who are found upon the watchtower, or in other words, all mine Israel, shall be saved. 
Now hold on to that definition in verse 12. We're going to need to, to come back to it later on in this revelation. He just defined all Israel for you. All mine Israel. They're the ones that are going to be saved. But who are they? They're the ones that are found upon his watch tower. Higher ground. Watching. Could you not watch with me one hour? A watchman on the tower. There's some great symbolism here that we find elsewhere in the Bible. And if you're, if you find, if you're found there, if you're watching, if you've risen above the lower standards of a wicked world all around you, if you've built this tower, this mountain of the Lord, and are found standing in holy places, isn't that what he said at the end of section 87? As war is poured out upon all nations, but who will be preserved? Stand in holy places and be not moved. Build your temple, erect your watchtower, and gather there. If you do, that's proof, speaking of evidence, that's proof that you are my Israel. You've let me prevail in your life. You've followed my commandments. You've built my house. You've ascended my tower. You're mine, and I'm yours, and you will be saved. Verse 13, they that have been scattered shall be gathered Ooh, scattering and gathering of Israel is in this temple building context. 14, all they who have mourned shall be comforted. Let your heart be comforted. Just let it in. I know you've been through hard things and, you, and, and justifiably you have mourned because of it. I hope that also includes mourning for your sins, not just for your circumstances. And with that godly sorrow, of course, you'll be comforted through forgiveness. 15, all they who have given their lives for my name shall be crowned. So there's the, the crown of the martyrs, speaking of jewels in the crown of God. Eight, uh, 16, therefore let your hearts be comforted concerning Zion, for all flesh is in mine hands. Be still and know that I am God. Remember that's what Joseph said? I, I couldn't get any answers from God, but the one thing that kept coming through to me was that phrase, be still and know that I am God. Well, even in the midst of this great answer to his two questions is that reiterated phrase, trust me, Moses. He got that word when he was at the shores of the Red Sea. Trust me, Abraham. Things are going to work out better than you can imagine here on Mount Moriah. Trust me, my people, Israel. You will prevail if you let me prevail in you. So let your hearts be comforted. Verse 17, Zion shall not be moved out of her place, notwithstanding her children are scattered. Ooh, there's a difference. Hmm. We're getting all these kind of fuzzy definitions of, of uh, or maybe overlapping is a better word than fuzzy. The Lord is clear. Uh, on Zion, is it, a, is it a place or a people? And he's like, yep, it's both. It's my, my pin is in the map still. Uh, Independence, Missouri, Jackson County is still the center place of Zion. Uh, I mean, it's the center place of the United States. It's kind of the center place of North America. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a good spot to set up camp, okay? The camp of Israel and gather all nations to it. And it's not going to be moved. I'm not removing my pin from the map. Even though the people that that pin was supposed to specify, they're scattered all over the place. County after county that you can't even remember. That's okay. The, the county worth remembering is still going to be Jackson. Okay, Zion shall not be moved out of her place. Now, this is going to be tricky, especially, what is this, 1833? So by 1839, when the saints are no longer in Missouri at all because of the extermination order? That's a real gut check for Joseph and the saints. Like, what? We're nowhere near it. But Zion can't be moved. We are still bound. And to this day... From what I've read online, there is no larger single private landowner in the state of Missouri than the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're still holding on to that property because Zion shall not be moved. Even if her children are scattered, they may be in Clay County, they may be in, in Illinois, they may be in Salt Lake, they may be in Japan and Korea and South Africa and Australia and the British Isles, they'll be everywhere. And that's okay. I still have my pin in the map. 
Verse 18, they that remain and are pure in heart. There's his other definition of Zion. This is Zion, all caps, bit up here in heart. They that remain and are pure in heart shall return and come to their inheritances. They and their children with songs of everlasting joy to build up the waste places of Zion. Ah, so the Zion place will ultimately be redeemed and rebuilt by those who have been Zion people all along. The pure in heart are the ones that return. You get a sense of, of the scattered tribes of Israel returning. You get a sense of, of Jerusalem, well, the Jews from Jerusalem being carried off to Babylon and then returning with songs of everlasting joy. To do what? To rebuild their Jerusalem. Oh, to kind of make it new. Oh, a new Jerusalem of sorts. Yeah, I get it. Uh, to rebuild their temple. Ah, that's what they're supposed to be who have built there all along. Mm-hmm. Amazing parallels here. Verse 19, all these things that the prophets might be fulfilled. Yeah, not just the prophet, prophetic uh, prophecies of future events, but what the prophets wrote about their own current events. This is, those were previews of coming attractions. Well, here's the attraction. And God always has his prophets back. I've always told you this would be the way it would be. And, and it's going to happen that way. Verse 20, behold, there is none other place appointed than that which I have appointed. Neither shall there be any other place appointed than that which I have appointed for the work of the gathering of my saints. That's it, pin in the map, keep it there. Jackson County, Missouri, independence will always remain the place appointed for the gathering. Verse 21, until the day cometh when there is found no more room for them. And then I have other places which I will appoint unto them and they shall be called stakes for the curtains or the strength. Of Zion. It's interesting. Uh, we're at a point where, you know, 16 and a half million members, I believe, right now. Uh, we wouldn't all fit in, in Independence, Missouri, right now, anyway. And, and, and so I'm grateful that there are, what, 3,000 stakes all over the world. I guess in some ways, uh, in a perfect world, the, the center pole is erected first, and then you start, you know, it's up high, and now we're spreading out the curtains of the tent of Zion and lengthen those cords and then strengthen those stakes and stick them into the earth to hold it all up. Well, I guess we're kind of reversing the process a bit. And, and scattered saints all over the world are gathering into stakes of Zion that are strong and becoming stronger. Those cords are being lengthened that bind them back to that center spot. And ultimately, someday, when a pure people, right? I will raise up a pure people unto me. They're the ones that will come with songs of everlasting joy. Well, when they return, it's like all the stakes are in place and the cords are there lengthened. We ready to do this? And to me, it's just fascinating to think what a, what a visual this would be. To have the, the tent all out there, the curtain spread, the stakes in place, and then, kind of last crowning moment, raise that center pole at the center place. And right before the world's eyes, this is the kingdom of God coming forth nobly, boldly, and independent. This is the army of the Lord. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as an army with banners. This is the woman coming out of the wilderness. And her tent has now filled the earth. Beautiful, beautiful things ahead. Uh, verse 22, Behold, it is my will that all they who call on my name and worship me, according to mine everlasting gospel, should gather together and stand in holy places. Places, plural. Stakes, plural, for the strength of Zion. And we have those gathering places all over. 23, and prepare for the revelation which is to come. Now, this is a different kind of revelation. We think of revelation in terms of spoken word, right? Or something uh, uh, in your head, in your heart, of, that you write down. Uh, and it's communication. Well, in this case, the revelation that we need to prepare ourselves and the world for is is not just words, but rather the Word of God Himself. Look at that in 23. The revelation which is to come, when the veil of the covering of my temple in my tabernacle, which hideth the earth, shall be taken off, and all flesh shall see me together. 
No wonder it needs to be the pure in heart that prepare all this, because the blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The revelation is Him. It's the second coming. And why are we planting stakes all around the world? Why are we gathering to centers of strength? Why are we trying to ultimately build this center spot in Missouri? Because Christ will come. Our role is... Every church has a role to play. There's such goodness out there. Uh, again, people living up to their highest beliefs that we're trying to turn their hearts towards. Uh, holy envy in both directions. So much good. I think in some ways, what's the specific role of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? To help, to help lead those efforts, to help coordinate them all. Specifically, we're responsible for priesthood ordinances uh, since priesthood power and authority has been restored in this church. We're responsible for revelation because prophets and apostles are here. But to think about coordinating this work of, of unveiling the earth, of spreading purity of heart and holiness of heart so that we can all see the Lord together when the veil is taken off. And notice it's not, we always think of the veil as like, the veil is what keeps us from seeing God. Not true, but in this verse, it's also it's what protects God from seeing us. And I use protect for, for a reason. It's like it's hiding the earth is what he said in 23. The veil is my temple. The veil is my tabernacle. And it's hiding the earth because that's a mess. I can't look at that. I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. So I need a veil to kind of fuzzy things a little bit so I don't see just how awful and evil things have gotten there. Oh, I'm aware, I am omniscient, but I want to protect my sensitive eyes. I want to protect you from, the, from that divine gaze so that you can sense and know you have time to change. Please take advantage of it. Repent of your sins. Clean up, clean things up so that then when I remove the veil, it's something worth looking at. Verse 24, he's going to keep describing the millennium for, for a page or two here. It's, it's a beautiful description of what we have. This is the preview of coming attractions. This is we want, what we want to be able to see and prepare the world for. 24, every corruptible thing, both of man or of the beasts of the field or the fowls of the heavens or the fish of the sea that dwells upon all the face of the earth shall be consumed. If it's corruptible, it gets consumed. If it's flammable, it, it gets burned at his coming. Uh, if it's not flammable, then it just gets purified by that fire. I mean, ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego what fire can do, okay, to the, to the purified, to the prepared. It, it's like one, one of the reasons I call this unshaken. There's a verse in Hebrews that says everything has to be shaken to be able to differentiate between what was well built and what wasn't. And so for us to remain unshaken, to be unconsumed, well, we now have evidence. We've built well. We're not corruptible. In 25, also that of element shall melt with fervent heat, and all things shall become new, that my knowledge and glory may dwell upon all the earth. I mean, the temple was the place where we were to come to know God and where God's glory could dwell. Well, ultimately, the whole earth is meant to become God's temple. And so are we preparing that by dotting the earth with temples as they begin to spread and converge until the knowledge and glory of God covers the earth even as the waters cover the sea. 26, in that day, when we finally get there, the enmity of man, and that's what you're struggling with in Missouri and in Kirtland, is enmity, hatred, opposition, the enmity of man and the enmity of beasts, yea, the enmity of all flesh shall cease from before my face. You ever seen that when siblings are fighting and then a parent walks in? And all of a sudden, it's like, we can't do this in front of dad. Or I wouldn't want my mother to see this. And all enmity ceases before the face of the Prince of Peace himself. 27, in that day, second phrase that has used that phrase, okay? We keep looking forward. Latter day saints, in that day, when we finally get there, whatsoever any man shall ask, it shall be given unto him. Talk about a blank check, but it's one that God can afford to give us because he knows we won't write anything on it that he wouldn't write himself. It's like when he gives Nephi, son of Helaman, the, the sealing power. 
You can do anything because I completely trust you. You have earned that complete trust. You won't do anything against my will. That's in that day. We've proven it. 28, in that day, Satan shall not have power to tempt any man because we won't listen to him. We've, we've outgrown that. We've weaned ourselves off of his wicked ways. 29, there shall be no sorrow because there is no death. In the book of Revelation, when he speaks of the Lord wiping away every tear from every eye, what's there to cry about anymore? Death itself is overcome. Those martyrs, you now see them fully crowned again. In verse 30, In that day an infant shall not die until he is old, and his life shall be as the age of a tree. I don't really understand what he means by that, but I do love the thought of just tree ring after tree ring, and children growing up to however long the tree grows, there's some real old ones out there. You lose count. And I guess that's what the point he's trying to make. Oh, you're not, you're not counting birthdays so much because there's just too many rings to number. Uh, there's, again, death is, not, is no longer an issue. What, 31? Well, I guess technically it is. When he dies, he shall not sleep. That is to say, in the earth at least. There's no need for burial. There's no time for that. Because you're changed in the twinkling of an eye and shall be caught up, and his rest shall be glorious. Not rest in the grave, rest in the glory, the glory of God. 32, Verily I say unto you, in that day when the Lord shall come, he shall reveal all things. I guess that's when the, the third part of the ninth article of faith finally uh, f it gets fulfilled. That there are, we believe there are many great and important things yet to reveal pertaining to the kingdom of God. It's amazing that there, of course we still have questions. Of course there are unanswered things or, or sources of confusion because God has yet to reveal many great and important things. But in that day, when we have lived by faith in the face of the unknown, well, now you've proven you're worthy to no longer have the unknown. You have believed the portion that I have given you. You have believed in part. Now you are ready and worthy to know in full. And so I will reveal all things. With my students, usually every semester, if I can squeeze it in, I'll do a Q&A period and just go, okay, it's all on the table. What do you want to talk about? And it's pretty exhilarating where it's like, really? We can ask anything? I'm like, yeah. I do reserve the right to say, I don't know. Uh, but, what, let's talk, but if I do know, I'll share all that I, that I can. And those are the fasc fascinating experiences. But man, my Q&As can't hold a candle compared to that one. Believe me, I'll be the one raising my hand like, yeah, there was a lot of stuff I never figured out. Can you help? And he's like, I believe I knew how much you couldn't figure out, Jared. Uh, your ignorance was obvious. But, but yes, let me pour out some light and truth. Now, with that in mind, I love verse 33. Because in 32, when he says, I'll reveal all things, in 33, he then gives us an example of some of the things he'll reveal. Now, because our ignorance is pretty limitless, he could have chosen all kinds of things. He could have said, I will tell you more about your mother in heaven. Oh, there's something I long to know more about based on that third part of the ninth article of faith. I would love to know her uh, better than, than the hints. I'm glad we have the hints, at least. That's more than anybody else. Uh, to know that she is there. But to know the details, can't wait. Uh, to understand the, the processes of the atonement more than just the result. I'm grateful I know the result. I've experienced it. But the logistics of God's love, oh, there's so much I'm excited to understand. Things about church history that Joseph Smith himself is, I'm sure, like, oh, that's how we were supposed to do it? Oh, okay, I did the best I could. I didn't. I knew the goal. I, my, my, my journey was a little circuitous. Uh, I tried my best. Yeah, that's true of all of us. But the one he picks in 33 to me is fascinating. And to any of you scientists out there, uh, or people that wonder about the age of the earth and the fossil record and, and how does this work, and I don't know, and any paleontologists that have just really tried to make sense of where did the dinosaur bones come from and, uh, and, and all of these kinds of things, 33 is for you. What will he reveal among all the things he reveals? 
things which have passed and hidden things which no man knew, things of the earth by which it was made and the purpose and the end thereof, things most precious, things that are above, things that are beneath, things that are in the earth, upon the earth, in heaven. Now, I just want to stop there and go, wait, wait, wait. You, of all the things you could have said you're going to tell me about later, you, you pick creation? And like how the earth was made? What? I don't need that lesson. I already got Genesis and I got Moses and I got Abraham and I got the temple. Four times you told me how the earth was created. And I picture the Lord going, oh, no, 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 that... You thought I was teaching geology? Why would I waste the temple on a geology lesson? No, it's theology I'm trying to teach you. And Genesis and Moses and Abraham, same thing. There are principles of your creation. You're the thing I'm trying to build. I mean, believe me, when you started, you were without form and void. That's why I you know, go to the gym. Uh, and and uh, to get to the point where you became very good, hmm. That's what I was trying to teach. Yeah, there's some elements there that can be applied to the physical creation of, of the earth, but oh, the details? Mm, you don't need to know that yet. You certainly weren't ready to understand it when Moses wrote, or when Abraham <laughs> wrote. You're, you're barely starting to figure it out now. So keep working on your science. Keep figuring out the origins of the universe. You're getting closer. There's still a lot you don't know. A lot that I'll need to reveal. But the, the young earth creationism, we're not forced into that camp. The, uh, I know the Big Bang or any kind of organic evolution are absolutely off the table. It's like, no, we're not forced into any of that. Uh, there are, there is, we are children of God. We can hold to that. We are created in God's image. There's, I, I don't go down... I don't agree with everything that science suggests. But it is amazing to see, uh, for anyone who's wrestling with those things or struggling with it, I go to section 101, verse 33, every time, that there are some things we just ha God has not yet revealed. And if you assume he did fully reveal that in the four places that I just listed, that wasn't his purpose in those revelations. Okay. When I need something about method, I usually turn to science. When I need something about meaning, I always turn to faith. Uh, the, the processes of the universe, yeah, I talk to my to science professor. But the purposes of creation, I'll turn to the Word of God. I'll go to the temple. There's, you understand what I'm getting at with that? I, I hope that helps, okay? Now, what else will we learn? Uh, all those precious things above, beneath, and so on in verse 34. And then 35, all they who suffer persecution for my name. Does that apply to any of you there in, in Missouri? Uh-huh, sadly. Any of you who suffer persecution and endure in faith, that's your part, though they are called to lay down their lives for my sake, there's worst case scenario, yet shall they partake of all this glory. So maybe not worst case scenario after all. Only worst case in the short term. Best case in the long term. So, verse 36, fear not. Fear not even unto death. For in this world your joy is not full, but in me your joy is full. Why try to hold on so desperately to mortal life when mortal life will never bring you the fullness of joy that eternal life will? Now, I'm not saying to, to just give up on your mortal life. Okay? There's this interesting contrary to prove. To not cling to life as if it was all that you had. But on the other hand, to trust in God's timing and hold to as much life as you possibly can. To make a difference in all the time that you can. Okay? But understand that fullness of joy is never going to come here anyway. That's for the other side. So, verse 37, therefore, care not for the body, neither the life of the body, but care for the soul and for the life of the soul. Now, don't take that verse to the extreme where it's like, care not for the body? Great, I don't have to shower again. And what the heck was the word of wisdom for? It's like, no, 
Your, if your body is the instrument of your spirit and the foundation of your character, like President Packer has taught, if your body is the temple of God and without it you can't receive a fullness of joy, take care of your body. And if you look at how much weight Elder Suarez and Elder Renlin have lost since they were called to the Quorum of the Twelve, and Elder Suarez specifically said, it's because President Nelson told me to. And he was acting as President Nelson as well as Dr. Nelson there saying, God needs you to live as long as you can because you have a ministry to perform. How do you think I'm doing so well in my mid-90s? <laughs> right? It wasn't just so I can ski down the ski slopes. It's so that I can keep building his kingdom long after the time most people are, are in the grave. I'm in the glory. And so, yes, care for your body. Yes, live the word of wisdom. All the do's, not just the don'ts. Uh, prolong your life as long as you possibly can, John the Beloved. But as far as priorities are concerned, that's, I think, what he's getting at in 37. Compared to the soul, the body doesn't mean much. So prioritize. Focus on those spiritual things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Everything else will be added unto you. Beautiful priorities being set here. Verse 38, you see more of that. Seek the face of the Lord always, that in patience ye may possess your souls, and ye shall have eternal life. Seek his face. Prepare for that grand unveiling, that ultimate revelation. When he removes the veil of ignorance, because you first removed the veil of unbelief, prepare for that. Be patient. Possess your souls. It's like I got, I got it all in hand. I'm the self-discipline. We got this. Verse 39. When men are called unto mine everlasting gospel and covenant with an everlasting covenant, they are accounted as the salt of the earth, the savor of men. This coming from the same source as the Sermon on the Mount. You are the salt of the earth. They are called to be the savor of men. Verse 40. Therefore, if that salt of the earth lose its savor, behold, it is thenceforth good for nothing, only to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. There is a big difference between table salt and road salt. They're both helpful in certain areas. I'm grateful for the, the mounds of salt I see on the side of freeways in Utah during the winter. Helps me drive. But that, that isn't good for much more than that. And, and we're, we're more than ice melt, brothers and sisters. We're meant to be the savor of men, to add flavor, to uh, help with preservation against the natural decay of the natural man. Are we that kind of person? We should be. That's what he's calling us to become. Verse 41, Behold, here is wisdom concerning the children of Zion. Still, I've got them in mind. Even many, but not all, they were found transgressors. Therefore, they must needs be chastened. Now, it's not a blanket condemnation. I know there were diamonds in the rough, but there was a lot of rough, and that rough needs to be chastened. The coal needs to be turned into diamond itself. Verse 42, He that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that abaseth himself shall be exalted. There's this role reversal. Uh, don't raise yourself up or the world will bring you down. Humble yourself. God will raise you up. 43, And now I will show unto you a parable that you may know my will concerning the redemption of Zion. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. I don't know about you, but sometimes the direct approach can be off-putting when you're being chewed out. You ever had that experience as a kid where your, your parents are just kind of laying into you all the things that you're doing wrong? And I see this in my own children sometimes where I can tell that like they've kind of zoned out and they're looking at me to kind of pretend that they're paying attention and receiving this, this, uh, uh, ch this chastisement. But it's like, oh, I can't handle it, Dad. So I'm just, my, uh, my mind is in my little happy place and I'm like, uh-huh, sorry, sorry, uh-huh, sorry. Uh, or you just put up the dukes and you're like, whatever, and, and we fight against it. Well, as... As much as we might try to push away condemnation, oh, everybody loves a story. And the amazing thing about a story is you can get kind of reeled into it, and by the time you realize that it was about you all along, darn it, it's too late. Convicted. <laughs> I, I heard the story. I realized what you're trying to get across. So if the first... 42 verses of this are a little too direct for the saints about their, their chastisement and the reasons behind it. Well, how about story time? And they're like, oh, okay. 
He's done chasing us. Let's, let's listen to this story. Well, here's the parable. It's about the redemption of Zion. Verse 44, A certain nobleman had a spot of land, very choice. And he said unto his servants, Go ye unto my vineyard, even upon this very choice piece of land, and plant twelve olive trees. Now, are we starting to see the symbolism unfold? Noble man? Well, there's no man that was ever more noble and great than Jesus. He's the Lord of the vineyard. Uh, it's a very choice piece of land. And what did he choose as his choice piece of land? Zion, independence, there's the center spot. He plants 12 olive trees. Ooh, 12. Okay, house of Israel. Oh, ye are my Israel, if you are on the watchtower. Keep that in mind. Yeah, you're Israel if you let God prevail, if you choose him so he can choose you. And the, all of the house of Israel, all 12 of you, are supposed to gather to this gathering place, Zion, which shall not be moved, even if the children are scattered. They're olive trees, and olive oil and olives, they're meant to feed the world. They're meant to give light to the world. You are the, I'm the light and life of the world where you're supposed to be also. It's for healing the nations. There's, it's to bring peace. There's so much about these olive trees that we're all supposed to become. Verse 45, though, you're up against something. So set watchmen round about them and build a tower that one may overlook the land round about to be a watchman upon the tower that mine olive trees may not be broken down when the enemy shall come to spoil and take upon themselves the fruit of my vineyard. Notice when the enemy shall come, not if. Opposition is the evidence that the truth is at work and the truth is at work here. So this wonderful choice spot of land, uh, these 12 olive trees that I'm planting, they're, they're going to be the, the target, the bullseye of attack. And so build a tower. Call a watchman. Keep an eye out so that you're prepared for the enemy when they come. 46, now the servants of the nobleman went and did. So far so good, right? I will go and do. Well, they went and did. They did as their Lord commanded them. They planted the olive trees, first and foremost. We started the gathering. They built a hedge roundabout. So we're trying to create some level of separation between wheat and tares, between olive uh, trees and surrounding uh, territory. They built a hedge roundabout and they set watchmen. So they've got leaders there that are looking out for things. And they began to build a tower. I mean, we did designate the place where the temple was to be built. God put the pin in the map. We started to gather. We, we, we want the temple to be underway. The temple, the tower in the story is the temple. The temple that was never built in independence. In verse 47, while they were yet laying the foundation thereof, that's as far as they got, they began to say among themselves, and what need hath my Lord of this tower? So notice they're just talking among themselves. They're not counseling with the Lord. It's like, are, are, are we still, are we good to go? Or do you still want this tower? It's, oh yeah, I still want the tower, believe me. Uh, no, they were just saying among themselves. And what are they questioning? The need. I mean, talk about a bunch of pragmatists, a bunch of utilitarians. It's like, what about my farm? Remember that Haggai verse? Oh, you and your sealed houses and you're letting my house lay waste? Oh, cons consider your ways. But why, why do we need a temple? We can have a chapel. We can have a church. Uh, why that? I don't, I don't get it. Well, 48, they consulted for a long time. And that to me is so ironic. Because if the consultation, kind of arguing among themselves, rationalizing and, and wondering, second-guessing God, if it lasted that long time, it makes you wonder, could they have been done with the tower by then? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's just a waste of time. No, no, what you're doing right now is the waste of time and use the time wisely, you'd be finished by now. I feel that way sometimes with my kids. It's like, man, if you actually would have started cleaning your room when you were asked to, instead of all this procrastination and complaining and whining about things, the room would be done by now, and you'd be on to other things. We haven't made any progress. They consulted for a long time. Months have passed, right? Saying among themselves, what need hath my Lord of this tower? Seeing this as a time of peace, that's another little wrinkle there. I mean, they're still wondering what need, but now it's like, again, especially based on conditions on the ground, what's, what's the point of building a temple when we don't need one? Why 
gather、uh, food storage when the supermarket's just down the street? Why? Oh, sing a bunch of songs and have a, a little lesson when my kids are so little. What, what's the point of family home evening when the kids don't really get it? Or why take them to church when they just spend sacrament meeting coloring or eating Cheerios?、Uh, well, because if you only prepare for war once war has broken out, then you're going to lose this war. Because When the, the, the time of action has arrived, the period of preparation has passed. Didn't President Monson say that?、Uh, it's a time of peace. Well, then take advantage of it and, and prepare yourself when, when it is no longer a time of peace. Take advantage of the time that you have. And they didn't. Verse 49, they keep asking, and this, is, this really condemns them Might not this money be given to the exchangers? For there's no need of these things. So, three times it's like, no need, no need, no need. As if God had to spell it all out. You understand why you're doing this? I may tell you, I might not. Just trust me. There is a need. I see the future. I mean, nobody's higher on the tower than I am. Heaven view? Yeah. Trust me. But the first time it's just, oh, why the need? Second time, why the need when it's peaceful? Third time, why the need when there's. Better ways to use this money. Because if we use it to build a temple, that's just an expense. We could have given it to the exchangers, and that's an investment. I can just picture the Lord saying, You have no idea what you're talking about when it comes to investments. I'm trying to endow you with power from on high, and an endowment is the investment that never runs out of return. Giving money to the exchangers? You want a high exchange rate? Come into my house and allow me to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing greater than you can possibly receive. The, the, the thought of giving money to the exchangers is to me so damning here because it's self centered. It's, it's, I want to get ahead. It's, how do I get rich? It's, what am I going to get out of this thing? It's, it's seeking a tangible profit. The things of this world instead of the next, the things of the body instead of the soul. Verse 50 While they were at variance one with another, and there's the jarrings, the contentions, the strife, the, at variance, they became very slothful.、Hmm, there's this, this laziness, this you, are, you must be commend, compelled in all things, the same as a slothful and not a wise servant. You're not living into the agency and the power within you. We saw back in section 58. So they're very slothful and they hearkened not unto the commandments of their Lord. We saw how many sections have begun with the word hearken and they're not doing it. And sure enough, I mean, you can almost prophesy the, in fact, the Lord did a few verses ago, verse 51, the enemy came by night. It was a matter of when, not if, and they broke down the hedge, they got rid of the separation. Was there really that much of a difference between the Latter day Saints and the Missouri neighbors if, if the, if the Latter day Saints are just as envious and, and contentious as everybody else? Yeah, no hedge, no separation between wheat and tares. And the servants of the noblemen arose and were affrighted. Ooh, there's the leaders of the church there that are, that are、uh, taking counsel from their fear instead of from their faith and, and signing this agreement that we'll evacuate the county. They were affrighted and fled. And the enemy. Destroyed their works and broke down the olive trees. That choice piece of land is no longer a gathering place. They're off in other counties whose names we tend to forget. Verse 52 Now behold, the nobleman, the Lord is still in charge, the Lord of the vineyard, called upon his servants and said unto them, Why? What is the cause of this great evil? How could this happen? Remember that was Joseph's question? That he couldn't get an answer to? Well, maybe it's because the Lord couldn't get an answer. The Lord's wondering, why would this happen when I told you everything you needed to know to avoid this? 53, ought ye not to have done even as I commanded you? And after ye had planted the vineyard and built the hedge round about and set watchmen upon the walls thereof, built the tower also? It's like you were doing so well until you got to that point. And like, oh, a hedge is enough or a wall is enough. Do we really need a tower? Come on. You should have built the tower also, and then set a watchman upon the tower, and watched for my vineyard, 
and not have fallen asleep, lest the enemy should come upon you. There's the could you not watch with me one hour. And watch with me on my tower. My watch tower. Isn't that what he said way back in verse 12? That my Israel, all mine Israel are the ones that are on my watch tower. In the temple. Fully awake and alert. Aware of what is going on in the world around them. That they need to be preparing. 54. And behold, the watchman upon the tower would have seen the enemy while he was yet afar off. That's what elevation does. You can see further than most people. And then ye could have made ready and kept the enemy from breaking down the hedge thereof and saved my vineyard from the hands of the destroyer. The destroyer, that's a title for the adversary. If you could have seen him coming, to think about how far off the apostles could see when they wrote the proclamation to the, family, uh, to the world on the family in 1995. At the time, I thought it was duh doctrine. Like, well, duh, everybody believes that. I just couldn't see very far, but they could. And they could see the confusion that reigns in our day over sexuality and over gender and over family issues. We could have, we could have been better prepared if we would have paid better attention Verse 55, the Lord of the vineyard said unto one of his servants, Go, and gather together the residue of my servants, the other ones that weren't scattered. Take all the strength of mine house, which are my warriors, my young men. And I'll even take those who are of middle age, okay? Also, among all my servants, who are the strength of mine house, save those only whom I have appointed to tarry. And go ye straightway unto the land of my vineyard, and redeem my vineyard, for it is mine. I have bought it with money. And based on what the Lord has done to claim all of us, it was a lot more than money that he sacrificed. Ye are bought with a price, oh, an infinite one. But do you understand what he's getting at in 55 and 56? He, this is where the, I mean, so much of the parable to this point is speaking of the past. And I think the, the brethren would be like, yeah, that's exactly what's happened in Missouri. Now he's starting to shift to the future. As Joseph asks, why is this happening? Well, there's the first half of the parable. Well, what are we supposed to do now? Well, here's the second half of the parable. You're supposed to gather your warriors. You're supposed to gather the strength of mine house. There will be some that are appointed to tarry because there's, somebody needs to stay at home and, and care for the, for the people that are here. Somebody needs to, to lead the church from headquarters. But anyone who's, I mean, the strength of my house, my warriors, my young men, gather them. And go straightway to the land of my vineyard. But you understand? Again, we have the, the benefit of hindsight. We know the story of Zion's camp. This is the first hint of what Zion's camp will be, will be called upon to do. Where Joseph is that servant. He is going to gather the strength of his house. Young men, some middle-aged. Some maybe not so middle-aged, but at least they're strong and want to gather. Some will tarry, others will come, and they will go straightway. March those 900 miles from Kirtland to Independence and try to redeem the vineyard because they own it. The Lord does. He's bought it with money and then some. Now 57, therefore get ye straightway unto my land. Break down the walls of mine enemies. Throw down their tower. Scatter their watchmen. Ooh, did you catch that? The enemy has walls too. The enemy has a tower even before we did, the enemy has their watchmen. There's an amazing how Satan counterfeits every good thing that Christ has, has given us. And to think of the kinds of separation of good and evil that the Lord intends, a hedge or a wall, and yet Satan counterfeits that and wants a different form of separation between peoples. Uh, a tower of strength in terms of the temple? Well, Satan has his towers as well, by which he, he broadcasts his falsehoods around the world. He has his watchmen, the, the, evil, in secret, the evil men in secret chambers seeking to destroy, uh, like we saw in the Word of Wisdom, conspiring men in the last days. Oh, it, it's, it's amazing to me, the parallels here between the two sides of this, of this war. 
in verse 58, inasmuch as they gather together against you. See, we're the ones that are supposed to be gathering. Well, the enemy will gather against us. Then avenge me of mine enemies, that by and by I may come with the residue of mine house and possess the land. I guess there have been enough cheeks bruised and turned that now it's justifiable uh, justice. It, it's vengeance is mine and the Lord is sending that army to avenge his saints. 59, the servant said unto his Lord, well, when, when shall these things be? And the Lord responded in verse 60, he said unto his servant, when I will go ye straightway and do all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Makes you wonder, like, when shall these things be in terms, well, what are you asking when about? When do you gather the saint, the, the, this army? I said straightway, let's get going. But when will my house, my vineyard be redeemed? Mm, well, leave that to me. And that's really important. I think that's one of the pizza, pieces that gets lost in this puzzle. Joseph and the others were very, okay, we're, do, we're ready to do this. And we're going to go and we're going to do it right away. And they organized Zion's camp and spring of next year, they're, they're marching down. Little did they know just how far off the answer to their, the ultimate question was. When will the redemption, it's one thing to send the army, but when will we win? When will the redemption of Zion be? Oh, when I will. Trust me, just do what I've asked you. Learn obedience. You still have to become Zion before you build it. 61, this shall be my seal and blessing upon you. A faithful and wise steward in the midst of mine house, a ruler in my kingdom. That is a, quite the blessing on you, quite the seal on you. I'd love to have that in the, on my... Oh, army insignia, that I'm a faithful and wise steward. Verse 62, his servant went straightway, did it now, just like he was told. He did all things whatsoever his Lord commanded him. And after many days, all things were fulfilled. And with that, the story ends. A happy ending. All things were fulfilled. Now, it was after many days, and sometimes the Lord's definition of many far surpasses our own. But he knows what he's doing, do we? I just wonder, by the end of this parable, do the saints understand the why and the what? Of what brought them into these, this mess, how they're going to get out of it? Joseph gets it because, again, he's going to start gathering Zion's camp as quickly as possible. Uh, with the story over, let's get back from, go from poetry back to prose, or from, from parable back to, to, to straight discourse. 63, again, verily I say unto you, I will show unto you wisdom in me concerning all the churches, inasmuch as they are willing to be guided in a right and proper way for their salvation. So that's kind of, that's what the story was for. Joseph, are you getting, did you get the, the point of my parable? I hope so. 64, that the work of the gathering together of my saints may continue, that I may build them up unto my name upon holy places, for the time of harvest is come, and my word must needs be fulfilled. So it is harvest time. We've got to gather together. Then we're going to separate wheat from tares. This is the parable of the wheat and the tares to go along with this parable of the vineyard, right? Uh, to gather and then separate wheat from chaff and put the white wheat in the garner so that it's protected. And then the, the, we'll uh, bind the, the tares into bundles and we'll burn the field. It, we're, it's time for all of this. So are you coachable? Will you accept my wisdom concerning the churches? 65, therefore I must gather together my people. That word gather shows up so many times in this, in this section. We're still trying to gather. And as Joseph said, the point of gathering the people of God in any age was to build a temple. Will you do it? I must gather together my people according to the parable of the wheat and the tares. Like I said, this parable now turns into the other. That the wheat may be secured in the garners to possess eternal life and be crowned with celestial glory, when I shall come in the kingdom of my Father to reward every man according as his work shall be. We see all kinds of, of symbols here that all point to the temple. We've seen the tent with its stakes. We've seen the, t the tower from where we, whereby we watch. We see a garner where we are gathered in to be preserved during this time of harvest. All of this build the temple. 66, while the tares shall be bound in bundles and their bands made strong, that they may be burned with unquenchable fire. Therefore, so now that you understand the purpose of these parables, a commandment I give unto all the churches, that they shall continue to gather together unto the places which I have appointed. 
the places, plural. Keep gathering to Zion when you're called to. Keep gathering to Kirtland, a center of strength, a stronghold for a temple is, is going up there as we speak. The, to gather to Perrysburg, New York, to gather to all these branches, but to come together where you can be safe and strong together. 68, nevertheless, as I have said unto you in a former commandment, let not your gathering be in haste, nor by flight, but let all things be prepared before you. Remember, it's God who will hasten his work in its time. But for you, don't be so hasty that you're unprepared for what is being asked of you. Again, that was the problem with all these saints jumping the gun before they were really saintly and going to Zion place before they became Zion people. So be careful about your haste. Trust in my timing and I'll hasten it in its time. 69, in order that all things be prepared before you, observe the commandment which I have given concerning these things, which saith or teacheth to purchase all the lands with money, which can be purchased for money, in the region round about the land which I have appointed to be the land of Zion, for the beginning of the gathering of my saints. Remember uh, when he said, it's my vineyard, I can redeem it because I bought it with money? Remember this is, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar? This is not saints marching into Jackson County saying, well, you might as well leave now because God has promised it to us anyway. It's like, mm, this, is no, this is not squatter's rights. This is not drive off the previous uh, inhabitants and just take over their territory. Uh-uh. This is render unto Caesar. This is have a, a deed and a title and go according to legal uh, framework. I mean, it's you got to do this thing right. And again, judging on the amount of land that the church legally owns in the state of Missouri, that's still what is happening today. 71, all the land which can be purchased in Jackson County and the counties round about, and leave the residue in mine hand. I'll work it out in my own time and in my own way, according to my own will. 72, now verily I say unto you, let all the churches gather together all their monies. Let these things be done in their time, not in haste. Observe to have all things prepared before you. And we've been doing that for almost the last 200 years, closing in on it, uh, to just slowly gather the money contribute to, the, to tithing and fast offerings and care for the poor and the needy and humanitarian aid and missionary service and building temples. And well, that's just what we're doing, the, following the Lord's law of finance. And that, not in haste, done in time, will allow us to gather to these centers of strength, plural, all over the world. 73, let honorable men be appointed, even wise men. Send them to purchase these lands. We need faithful and wise stewards after all, okay? 74, the churches in the eastern countries, like where Joseph and Sidney had just been on their mission, when they are built up, if they will hearken unto this council, they may buy lands and gather together upon them. And in this way, they may establish Zion. We just got to keep the horse before the cart, okay? We need to uh, make sure that things are prepared. And if you are prepared, you shall not fear. Yeah, and if you're prepared, they won't fear you, okay? This will be going according to order. 75, there is even now already in store sufficient, yea, even an abundance to redeem Zion and establish her waste places no more to be thrown down were the churches who call themselves after my name willing to hearken to my voice. That to me is one of the most mind-blowing verses in this period of church history. Section 101, verse 75 is amazing because in it, the Lord says, oh, you could do it right now if you just be obedient. And I'm thinking, oh, this is 1833. And here I am reading it in 2021, thinking, why haven't we not yet redeemed Zion? I mean, this is what I call the wander, wander, die principle. I've mentioned it before. It's based on uh, well, originally on the children of Israel coming to the promised land. And like I said at the beginning of today's lesson, will you listen to fear or to faith? And 10 spies go with fear and two spies go with faith. And the Lord says, bummer, if you're going to go with majority rules. And sadly, the Israelites did. He said, that's okay. The promised land's still going to be there 40 years from now. And I'm eternal, so I can wait. So why don't you just wander, wander, die, wander, die? And then your children will grow up and get a second chance. And Joshua and Caleb, must have been some interesting deja vu for them as two old timers kind of limping over to the Jordan River. Uh, they weren't that old. 
But getting to the Jordan and just thinking, hey, Caleb, yeah, Joshua, you remember this? 40 years ago, we're the only ones left from that generation. All these kids have grown up, got strong legs after 40 years of wandering. Will they have strong faith? Oh, I think so. Well, then give me this mountain, right? Let's cross the Jordan. Let's take the promised land. And they did. And it wasn't even that hard. I mean, blowing trumpets and going around Jericho, and they, they conquered by the... Th they, they won with a marching band. <laughs> and to, to see the faith that they showed because, because they needed it. God even says at one point there, oh, by the way, you children who grew up after 40 years of wandering, if you still don't have faith, I'm still eternal. Maybe it's going to be the grandkids. And they're like, no, 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 we'll go. We're, we're good. We have faith. We're done with wander, wander, die. Let's believe and go in and live. And they did. When Moses comes down from the mount with the, the tablets of stone, we talked about this with the oath and covenant of the priesthood and everything in section 84. The higher law was right in front of them, which means God was prepared to give it to them. He already had. They just weren't prepared to receive. And there is, God is like, okay, Moses, break it and come up for a watered down version. Don't worry, I can, I'm eternal, I can wait. Just the house of Israel will wander, wander, die, wander, die for the next 1,200 years, give or take, until Jesus comes to give Melchizedek authority again. I do wonder about verse 75 and the principle of wander, wander, die. If then, even now already, there was in store sufficient, if there was enough, and more than enough, if there was an abundance to redeem Zion, you can do it right now. You can establish your waste places. They don't have to be thrown down anymore. You can still build that temple right now. If you'll hearken to my voice, those who are my church, at least those who call themselves after my name, there's so much packed into verse 75. And to me, it's just one more echo of the problem we keep seeing throughout the history of God's so-called people. Will we live into that? I remember talking to a seminary class. Oh, I've done this several times among youth groups and say, has the prophet ever told you you're the greatest generation of youth? And they're like, yeah, we are. And I say, yeah. <sighs> President Nelson has said that to you, or President Monson has said that to you, or President Hinckley has said that to you. Well, President Benson said that to me. And if there's any old timers in the group, I'm like, how about you? Did Wilford Woodruff, no, I'm no, just kidding. Did David and McKay say that to you? And they're like, yeah, actually he did. Yeah. Do um, you know the first prophet that said, you are a chosen generation? And they're like, uh, was it Joseph Smith? I'm like, it was Peter in the New Testament. <laughs> in fact, it was Moses in the Old, that you are a peculiar people, uh, a holy nation. At least you're supposed to be. And I just wonder, on the one hand, don't get cynical. This is not prophets going like, hey, you want to see me pump up the youth? They love it when I say this. You're the greatest one. I'm like, no, that's, that's not what they're doing. You really are the greatest one. You've surpassed your predecessors. The question is, will there still have to be greater generations yet to surpass you? Or will there be a generation that finally decides to truly hearken to the Lord's voice? Because if we've already had in store sufficient, yea, even in abundance, if God was ready nearly 200 years ago to redeem Zion, have we been wander, wander, die, wander, die to some degree? Again, he's not blanket statement. There are those diamonds in the rough that are ready and would have redeemed it on their own if they could have. But collectively, will we be Zion so we can build Zion? I've honestly wondered if that's one of the reasons that no man knows the day nor the hour of the second coming. Because nobody really knows when we'll finally figure it out. And when, there, when will there be a generation that isn't just told that they're the greatest generation, but actually proves it through their obedience and their diligence and their faithfulness, their willingness to hearken to the voice of God. Uh, there's more I could say about this, but I hope the Holy Ghost... I'm not trying to do a guilt trip. I'm not trying to condemn everyone older than youth age right now. I, I just, I sense a little of the Lord's 
divine discontent when I ponder verses like 75. You were so close. The bank of the Jordan River, the foot of Sinai, right there in Independence, you had it. And I'm still living in Salt Lake with an eye to western Missouri, wondering when the day will come. Well, let's finish this chapter. There's still quite a few verses left. 76, again I say unto you, those who have been scattered by their enemies, it is my will that they should continue to importune for redress and redemption by the hands of those who are placed as rulers and are in authority over you. So kind of 75 is this climax. We hit this apex and then it's like, okay, but what do we do in the meantime? Well, go through legal channels. We're trying to buy the land legally. Well, then we should be able to, if we talked about the constitutional law of the land back in section 98, well, we're coming back to that. And if there are honest men and good men and wise men, and yes, sadly, it was only men in those days. And sadly, they weren't always honest or wise or good. Okay. Uh, but if there are such people that you can turn to for legal redress, then do that. In fact, importune them. There's a parable he's going to refer to in a moment. This is the third parable. He, he gives us one, refers to the parable of the wheat and the tares. And then thirdly, he'll re refer to the parable of the importunate widow. Not unfortunate widow, although she was that too. The importunate means one who importunes, who, ple who pleads, who begs. And she's the one, I actually referred to this a couple of weeks ago. She's the one that keeps begging the judge, the unjust judge. Hmm, there's a parallel. To please be just to me. I'm not even asking for your mercy. I'm just asking for your justice. And that's your job for crying out loud. Please re redeem what is mine. Defend me from mine enemies. Well, he's about to reiterate the parable of the importunate widow, a.k.a. the parable of the unjust judge. And here he's, he's hinting at that. He's asking them to importune your civil authorities for redress and redemption. Ultimate redemption will come from me, but if they're doing their job, they should be able to help you right away. 77, according to the laws and constitution, the constitution of the people, which I have suffered to be established and should be maintained for the rights and protection of all flesh, according to just and holy principles. You see the, the echo of what we studied in section 98? Rights, protection, all flesh, all mankind is what he said earlier. 78, that every man, and that's not with an asterisk like the declaration should have had in Jefferson's day. He does mean every man, and, all, and he includes every woman there too. That every man may act in doctrine and in principle pertaining to futurity. It's interesting, the con we're already seeing an eye to consequence of things. According to the moral agency which I have given unto him, that every man may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment. You see, this is why I love the 101 version even better than the 98 version. Because section 98 was like, oh yeah, rights and privileges and freedom for all. Awesome. Sometimes that's all we think that it entails. This is the second half. Well, what about futurity? What's the results of your use of agency and freedom? Because that's a scary thought. We have divorced rights from responsibilities in our day, sadly. We've, di we've divorced freedom in the present from consequences in the future. And so here where he speaks of futurity, here, here where he speaks of accountability and judgment, Oh, that's the other half, of, that's the other side of the coin. Don't just fixate on the heads of, of section 98. Well, here's the tails. Actually, it's all heads and tails. It's a marvelous coin, both sides of it. And to see that we need to be accountable and responsible, that's what King, uh, King Mosiah was aiming at when he switched the government in his day. 79, therefore, it is not right that any man should be in bondage one to another. I mean, that's as clear as you can get on the Lord's state, uh, se uh, sense of slavery as they're trying to establish Zion in a slave state. Yeah, bondage is just flat out wrong. And not just uh, chattel slavery, but economic bondage and social bondage and, uh, and any of those other kinds of forms. I have made you free, so you're free indeed. Verse 80, for this purpose have I established the constitution of this land by the hands of wise men whom I raised up unto this very purpose and redeemed the land by the shedding of blood. 
Oh, there's a great U.S. history lesson. Who established the Constitution? Was it A, James Madison? Was it B, you know, fill in the blank? Or C, God? Hmm. I guess if there's a D, all of the above, I, I give shared credit, okay? God does work through mortal men. And as he says here, he raised them up. But at the end of the day, if there's only one option, I'm going to go with God. God established the Constitution of the United States, which has then become the model for every other free constitution in, a, in every democratic country in the world. We sometimes forget just what a novel experiment the U.S. Constitution happened to be. Yes, there were uh, echoes and parallels and precedents in the British Constitution and, and elsewhere, but nothing on earth quite like the U.S. Constitution that God established by the hands of men, wise men, remember? Seek diligently for them, uphold them. If they're honest, if they're wise, if they're good, well, they were wise men, and he raised them up for that. I have, I've read of just secular historians that have posed the question, if we could figure out how such a collection of, of intellects could be produced by such a sparse population in, in frontier colonial America to produce the, the founding fathers, it, it, he said, if we could figure out how that's possible and could somehow reproduce it, it's amazing what the future could hold. And it's like, well, here's a hint. God has to be behind it. Sorry to break it to you. But to gather that, again, the, the percentage of incredible minds growing out of what the British Empire still considered a colonial backwater, well, they, those, those boys grew up to be pretty good, to be pretty wise, because the Lord helped raise them. They weren't perfect, and neither was the Constitution. I wouldn't say that the three-fifths compromise was exactly what God wanted it, because as we saw in the previous verse, it's against God's will that there should be any bondage from one person to another. Uh, there were some ugly compromises, uh, and notice he said that they were wise men raised up. Not all of them were always honest and always good, sadly. But we do have an inspired and inspiring constitution written by inspired and largely, for the most part, inspiring founders. None of us are perfect. We could say the same thing of prophets. But I'm, I'm so grateful that we do have at the, at the basis uh, of, of the government of the United States and the governments of free countries around the world principles of right and responsibility, principles of agency and accountability, principles of freedom and futurity. We just need to keep both halves of those together. And, and they're seeming to fray a bit in our day. We need to be careful with that. Verse 81, now unto what shall I liken the children of Zion? Well, while we're talking about parables, let me give you another one. I will liken them unto the parable of the woman and the unjust judge. For men ought always to pray and not to faint. That was the moral of the story that Luke attached before he even shared the parable. Which saith, and then he repeats it. There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. Notice she's a widow, so she doesn't have anyone else to turn to in that time, in that time period at least. And he would not for a while. The, the wheels of justice grind, turn slowly sometimes. But afterwards he said within himself, eh, Though I fear not God, nor regard man. This is a lousy. Not only is he unworthy of God's uh, trust, but he's unworthy of the people's uh, vote. He doesn't care about God or man. Yet because this widow troubleth me, I'll avenge her. Lest by her continual coming she weary me. It's like, ah, oh, get her off my case. Like she just keeps coming back to, uh, to the Court of Appeals. Like, no, just fine. I'll, I'll do it, okay? Get, quit bugging. Well, I think at one point Joseph Smith even said, weary God until he blesses you. Keep pleading. Now, don't do the 116 pages version. When you have got a clear answer and it was no, and you know that, then accept God's will. But if God hasn't come out with a clear no, and, and that's clear here in terms of, well, when's it going to be? Well, when I will. Okay, is it yet? Is it yet? Is it yet? Keep asking. Pray always. Do not faint. Because with those prayers, hopefully you're also preparing. With that not fainting, hopefully you're also 
becoming more faithful. And thus, he says in 85, will I liken the children of Zion. It's just like you. So what do you do? Follow her example. 86, let them importune at the feet of the judge. Keep it on the local level. 87, if he heed them not, let them importune at the feet of the governor. Go to the state level. 88, if the governor heed them not. This is not looking very good, by the way. This does sound like the unjust judge. Shouldn't have been lo- f- fixed on the local level? Well, yeah, it should have. But if he's not wise and good and honest, then forget about it. Then go take it up the next step. That's why there are these levels of government. And worst case scenario, verse 88, if the governor heed them not, let them importune at the feet of the president. I guess that wasn't worst case scenario. It does get worse. 89, if the president heed them not, then will the Lord arise and come forth out of his hiding place and in his fury vex the nation. In his hot displeasure and in his fierce anger, in his time will cut off those wicked, unfaithful, and unjust stewards and appoint them their portion among hypocrites and unbelievers, even in outer darkness, where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, that's not outer darkness in the theological realm. These are not sons of perdition. They didn't sin against a perfect gospel light, but they did sin against a a clear government light, a a clear responsibility based on their office, What do presidents swear to do in the swearing in, in the inauguration, to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States? And all these levels, will 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 the mayor do it, or a local judge? Will the state, the governor do it? Will the federal government, the president do it? No? Fine. Then God will do it. I guess we're at time number four again. How many times do you have to turn the cheek? Local, state, federal, fine. God steps in. And vengeance is his. And he will hold you accountable since you didn't hold the, God's enemies accountable. Uh, you didn't do your job. You didn't defend the Constitution as you promised to. By the way, the saints did all of this. They did all these levels of appeal and were turned away at every one of them. One of the more famous, and it didn't happen here, it happened later, after they were completely driven out of the state of Missouri, and Joseph Smith and this famous trip to Washington, D.C., meets with then-President Martin Van Buren and explains the church's situation. We'll see more of this when we get to section 123 and the Liberty Jail letters and all that the saints were going through then. But according to the story, Martin, uh, Martin Van Buren famously says to Joseph Smith, well, your cause is just, but I can do nothing for you. I'd lose the vote at the state of Missouri which paints him in a horrible picture in terms of just, uh, I mean, speaking of pragmatism and utilitarianism, I don't care about justice, I just want to keep my job. And and there's more Missourians than there are Mormons, and so I'm going to go with majority rules, sorry. Well, that's not the, the law of the land, that's not constitution. Now, in Martin Van Buren's defense, uh, in as much as he deserves one, at the time period, Pre-Civil War, states' rights was a huge issue, and popular sovereignty. I mean, I mean, that's what South Carolina secedes from the Union over. It's like, nope, that, that was the nullification of crisis when Section 87 was first received. It's like, no, we can nullify anything the government wants to do because we're our own states. I mean, they didn't even start calling it the United States of America as a single union. After the Civil War, they started saying the United States is. Before that, they always used to say United States are. Like, the United States are the land, the country of my, of my birth. You're like, wait, are? Yeah, there are a bunch of states that happen to be united, but it's the states, separate, single. It's only after it was fused into one. Speaking of the land redeemed by the shedding of blood, boy, the Civil War did that, to fuse out of many states one United States of America. Okay, E pluribus unum, before the Civil War, it was a lot more pluribus and not quite unum, okay? And, and what's interesting during that time period is the, the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights applied to the United States government, the federal government. Congress will not issue or establish any law that will interfere with the free exercise of religion. But state legislatures could kind of cackle and go, well, the U.S. Congress can't uh, abridge uh, or interfere with religious freedom, but... That doesn't mean the states can't. 
So there may have, some scholars and historians have suggested, perhaps Martin Van Buren really did have his hands tied to a certain degree, where it's like, I can't go in and, and abrogate states' rights. Actually, when Joseph Smith ran for president in 1844, and he even said, I never would have, I don't want to be president. I, I had a good day job, profit. Uh, I'd rather be president of the church than president of the United States. He said, the only reason I ran is because no one else would defend the freedom of all mankind religiously as the Constitution requires. And one of the th suggestions he made, there was a lot of great suggestions that proved wise in retrospect that other people even admitted, like, yeah, it's, Smith had a solution for slavery that would have worked and would have circumvented the Civil War. Wish we would have listened to that, even if we hadn't voted for him. But there was another one uh, where he said, the President of the United States should always have the power to call upon, or he's the commander in chief, to call upon and send out troops to be able to put down any kind of local or state insurrection that is interfering with the rights of some beleaguered minority. Having had experience as a beleaguered minority myself, I, that, and the president does have that, that, uh, that power, but in the 1830s, that didn't cross anybody's mind. Okay? So, uh, your cause is just, but I can do nothing for you. Was it self-serving? Probably. Uh, was it his hands tied? Perhaps. I, I do sometimes chuckle a little. If I remember correctly, uh, when when Wilfred Woodruff has his vision of the Founding Fathers in the St. George Temple, and they appear to him and say, okay, you've got a temple. We gave you religious freedom. You need to give us freedom uh, from the bondage of sin. You need to do the work for the dead for us. And those wise men that God raised up unto that very purpose, well, they were demanding, it's amazing, the same personality that demanded freedom from Britain also came to, back to earth to demand freedom from spiritual bondage. What's amazing is uh, Wilfred Woodruff, yes sir, and did baptisms for the dead, uh, and, and uh, priesthood ordinations for the dead, and all these, you know, the endowment, the whole bit, to, to free the founding fathers. And other historical figures that he knew would be demanding that as well. And he did a bunch of presidents of the United States, but if I remember the, the story correctly, he wouldn't do Martin Van Buren's. There was a few others also, but when it came to Martin Van Buren, I believe he said, when his cause is just, we'll perform the work for him too. And I just can't help but think of, did that phrase kind of stick in Wilford's mind where it's like, well, your cause is just, but I can do nothing for you. And he's like, well, when your cause is just, because it isn't yet, then maybe we'll do something for you. Yeah, yeah that was a tough one to get over <laughs> for those saints who lived through the Missouri time period. And Wilford Woodruff was one of them. Anyway, uh, interesting that the Civil War, by the way, the saints safe in their mountain stronghold in, in a new western Zion. Look back at the civil war taking place and saw verse 90 fulfilled. With hot displeasure and fierce anger and wicked and unfaithful and unjust stewards weeping, wailing, and gnashing their teeth. Now, 92, pray ye therefore that their ears may be opened unto your cries. Mine already are. Okay? They have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, but they need to enter into the ears of, of local judge and state legislature or governor and president of the United States. Pray that they'll have a soft heart and an open ear, that I may be merciful unto them, that these things may not come upon them. Pray that they'll be merciful to you so that I can be merciful to them. Pray that there's no... Mormon war in Missouri, so there doesn't have to be a civil war in the United States. Well, both wars ended up occurring. 93, what I have said unto you must needs be, that all men may be left without excuse, justifiable. Okay, no excuses here. You've given enough evidence with all these turned cheeks. 94, that wise men and rulers may hear and know that which they have never considered it is interesting that the anti-Mormon persecution in Missouri did put Mormonism on the map, not just in Washington when, when Joseph Smith went to meet with President Van Buren, but in Eastern newspapers, and as their readers read about these accounts of, I don't know much about Mormonism, and I certainly don't want to join their church, but this is really happening in the land of the free, in the home of the brave? I, seriously? What's going on out there in the backwoods of Missouri? 
And, and they did begin considering things that they'd never considered before. 95, that I may proceed to bring pa to pass my act, my strange act, to perform my work, my strange work, that men may discern between the righteous and the wicked, saith your God. We talked about this strange work earlier on, but the, here the Lord reiterates it, and it's like, I want people to understand what's going on. And as they say, if, if, if all publicity is good publicity, well, the saints are suffering some really hard things, but there is publicity about these things starting to spread, and it is affecting people, and they're beginning to discern between the righteous and the wicked. And many of them are coming down on the saints' side because there's enough evidence of Latter-day Saints turning the other cheek. Now, sadly, there are times where they, they fought and, and there were people who, times when they were justified and probably some times when they weren't. And so there were uh, others that said, no, the Mormons deserve this. They're, they're fighting back. But, or, or they're causing problems themselves, whatever it might be. And yes, there was some guilt there. But by, by and large, the way the saints responded to these things, by turning cheeks, and, and offering evidence, standing as witnesses from their higher moral ground, it became more and more obvious to people who were the righteous victims and who were the wicked aggressors. And it did make, give them pause to consider the Lord's strange work. Why would anyone be willing to suffer like these saints are suffering? For some beliefs that I normally would have just laughed at the first time I heard it and shrugged it off. In fact, I did. But now it's making me kind of think, why would they do this? It's like people who go to, like the, 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 there's a sister, true story, who went to the Book of Mormon musical in, in Broadway and was so kind of disgusted by the anti-Mormon ridicule that, uh, the, 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 and yet the church is higher ground because saints weren't out protesting and they weren't suing Parker and Stone. They... They were taking out ads in the playbill going, hey, you thought the, the play was good? Come read the book. It's, it's, the book's always better. And she did just that. And kind of disgusted by what she'd seen, she said, I need, felt like I needed to take a shower. I felt so dirty after I watched the musical. She went online and started looking at real Mormonism. She started to consider the Lord's strange act and ended up joining the church. A pretty amazing story. Well, Verse 96, again I say unto you, it is contrary to my commandment and my will that my servant Sidney Gilbert should sell my storehouse, which I've appointed unto my people, into the hands of mine enemies. Now all this is kind of like screeched to a halt, like, whoa, we were talking about big picture things and, and seeking redress and importuning. It's like, well, yeah, but at the end of the day, what do you do on the ground? Sidney Gilbert, who had been sent down to be the bishop's agent and help Bishop Partridge, he's the one running the store, the bishop's storehouse. Yeah, don't sell it. Okay, uh, don't sell my storehouse. The Lord's claiming it there for himself. And, and it's, it's there for the, for the people, even if my people aren't there anymore. Don't sell the land. Don't sell the property. Hold on to it. It'll be for a wise purpose in me. I'll redeem the land because I own it. I purchased it with money. He does similar, he gives similar counsel to the rest of this section. 97, let not that which I have appointed be polluted by mine enemies, by the consent of those who call themselves after my name. See, if you just leave it to them and you sell it to them, it's as if you're giving them consent. And they can say, what? They sold it. We didn't drive them out. It was just, it was fair exchange. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I mean, yes, it was at the, at the point of a pitchfork or the, the butt of a gun, but, uh, or the muzzle of a gun. It's, but they sold it. No, we're not going to give you any, any grounds. Uh, there will be no legal justification for what you did. And even if we are out a storehouse, we still own it. Even if we're off the land, we will not pretend that you had our consent in leaving it behind. We'll still own it. In verse 98, for this is a very sore and grievous sin against me. I'm giving consent or seeming to give consent to, to help the enemy uh, pollute the, the Lord's inheritance. It's a very sore and grievous sin. Remember that phrase, a very grievous sin, came up over and over and over, that they're not considering the great commandment to, give a, to build a temple. 
a very grievous sin against me and against my people in consequence of those things which I have decreed and which are soon to befall the nations. You've got to hold on to this territory. Therefore, it is my will that my people should claim and hold claim upon that which I have appointed unto them, though they should not be permitted to dwell thereon. So that, that, that's in some ways the most specific and, and applicable counsel. But what do I do with my land? I agreed to leave. Do I sell it? Remember when they were first told to gather to Ohio and he said, well, what do we do with what we, where we live? And he said, oh, you've got a couple options. You could sell it. You could rent it. You could just leave it. And you can picture the saints going, huh? Is that even an option? So, well, it's, it, it's actually the easiest of the three. You don't even have to hire a realtor. Just walk away. Uh, just hold on to the, the deed. Okay. Well, that's exactly what's happening here in Missouri. You're being forced off your land, even if you're not permitted to dwell there. But claim it. Hold claim to it. Uh, and we'll see in section 123 that someday in the future, that might be an important detail. I still don't know what that means, but maybe we can imagine. Verse 100 then, nevertheless, I do not say they shall not dwell thereon. It's not too late still. For inasmuch as they bring forth fruit and works meet for my kingdom, they shall dwell thereon. Remember, the axe is laid at the root of the tree, but we're still deciding what kind of tree it is. And if it's the kind of tree that needs to be chopped down, then I'm going to remove my... Actually, you already kicked me off, so I don't have to remove myself. I'm not going to be there to shield the roots from the, from the, the, the axe chopping. But if you're a tree that brings forth good fruit... It was in a choice land. It was by a pure river. If you'll yield the fruit that you're capable of, then you can dwell there. Like we saw in verse 75, there's enough right now. There's an abundance. You could do it if you just obey. I'm preparing you for a sad future based on your track record, sad as well, of disobedience. But you could turn it around. It's not too late. Verse 101, they shall build. Another shall not inherit it. They shall plant vineyards. They shall eat the fruit thereof. Even so, amen. I love the way he ends this revelation on a, a hopeful note. It doesn't have to be this way. You can redeem Zion right now. Go back and, and prove that you're a Zion people and you can hold on to that Zion place. Become a tree of life. Rather than partaking of the fruit of the tree of, of good and evil, and mostly evil in your case, be better than that. And you'll, what you've built, no one else will come to occupy it. What you've planted, you'll be the one eating the fruit rather than them. Speaking of wander, wander, die, and going into the promised land, ancient Israel was told, you'll go into a land that you didn't have to work for. Someone else already built it. You'll drink from wells you didn't dig and eat from vineyards you didn't plant. Now, be careful you don't forget God in all that if it seems too easy. Well, there was nothing easy about establishing Zion in Missouri, but there is this sense there of being on the other side of the Canaanite conquest. Will you be worthy of the promised land by keeping your promises to God? Sadly, the saints in that day were unable to live up to it. And sadly, I wonder if the same applies to us as we keep waiting for better generations to come. God has given us enough. There are watchmen on the tower, and there are towers beginning to dot the planet. I am so grateful to be living in an age of the gathering, following a prophet that is incessant in his calls, to participate in this gathering of Israel. No greater work than we can be involved in. Did, has he read the parable? <laughs> I'm sure he has. And he's no longer asking, what need is there? He's saying there is need, even when there's a not enough people on the ground to even justify it. Some of the places that we are building temples, the church still isn't that large. But it's large enough to be to be filled with Latter-day Saints who, who desire those blessings, who are heeding the voice of God through his prophets and are trying their best to gather in faith and in righteousness. And God is rewarding their desires. 
with a tower right there in their midst. I am, I'm in awe of the revelations that we've studied today, uh, to understand why they've suffered and, and what hope they have for their future. This history will continue on next week as we get into Zion's camp itself, as the strength of mine house is being gathered to go and redeem Zion. But even that's going to come as a shock and a surprise as far as just how long they're still going to have to wait until it's finally redeemed. Are we still Zion's camp? Do we have our eyes fixed on that promise of futurity? I testify that there is strength sufficient to redeem Zion if we will obey the voice of God. He is calling us to come. Will we?